So ma'am, uh, the research questions that I am uh, trying to understand from this particular uh, research undertaken is that the first one is, uh, does the pre present law which prevents cybercrime against women be considered as having a deterrent effect or a preventative effect on future perpetrators? So uh, we have like certain sections under the Indian Penal Code and we have certain sections under the IT Act, which helps us to uh, you know, prevent cyber crimes against women. So the aim of my research paper is to understand what kind of effect these kind of crimes have against, I mean, these kind of uh, punishments and these kind of uh, provisions of law again, have against preventing crimes against women. Uh, and the second aspect is um, understanding uh, cyber crimes in light of the routine activities theory and general strain, strain theory to find a solution for reduction of such crimes. So, um, Looking at this through a criminological basis, we can understand that there are two important theories under criminal law, which is the routine activities theory and the general strain theory. So the routine activity activities theory states that when there is a absence of a proper guardian, that's when a crime is tend to occur more. And the general strain theory states that like certain strains in individuals' life can lead to that person committing crimes. So I'm also trying to understand how we can apply these theories to cyber crime specifically against women. Uh, and then um, also I would like to understand how effective have the laws been relating to the prevention of cybercrime against women and protecting them from cyber harassment online. Now, uh, moving on to my method of study, it's a purely doctrinal uh, way of research and it's conducted by uh, uh, by uh, by the doctrinal research method and, not, uh, and I have not relied on any empirical data as such as it's a theoretical ap application of certain uh, cyber cyber crim sorry certain criminological theories. Now, um, now I would like to explain the utility and contribution of my research. So, understanding uh, cyber crimes um, through deterrent and preventative theories of punishment is important because, um, despite there being such stringent provisions of law, we can see that especially after COVID-19, when we have had like a integration of virtual spaces and like um, offline spaces together because of like people working from home and like people actively using the internet more, we can see that there's an increase in cyber crimes, specifically the gendered nature of cyber crimes against women. Uh, now, when we speak specifically about the routine activities theory, um, this can be understood in the light that when there is, when women are on the online sphere, specifically when they're users of online platforms, they're using it as individuals. And due to this particular reason, we can see that we can see that the there's an absence of like a guardian, as I mentioned before. And because of this particular reason, when when women are alone or like not alone, I would like to state like just to bring in more clarity. When you're solely using a social media platform, you represent yourself. And in that light, there's a very high chance that women are targeted specifically because of their gender. And this actually affects their right to like freely exercise and like free, freely interact on the online sphere. Uh, and then another aspect is understanding legal protection for women against, sorry, understanding legal protection for women against cyber crimes and cyber harassment in India. Now, um, as I mentioned before, post during the COVID-19 era and after that, there has been a lot of uh, cases as we have witnessed where women have been affected because of their gender. So that is why I, underta I undertook this study. Now talking about the general strain theory, applying this, it can be understood that if a person has already been victimized on online platforms and has undergone, has undergone, uh, undergone a strain related to that, there's a very high chance that that person may commit such crimes again through online platforms in the future because uh, it, it leads to this kind of like a vicious cycle. Um, and um, now moving on to my tentative findings and uh, uh, certain suggestions. So one of the main reasons is that it's easy to mask yourself online and you know uh, portray yourself in an anon anon anonymous manner. And a lot of times women don't like, they don't like, despite, you know, maybe going through a certain form of uh, you know, harassment online, which can include like, you know, sometimes their photos being morphed or they're, they're getting hate messages because of their gender when they express their, uh, express their opinions online. It's a lot of times it tends to happen from an online, um, sorry, it tends to happen from an anonymous perspective. So, uh, for example, I would like to like, um, 
bring in a real life example of how um, recently there was a news of a uh, very famous Indian actress whose photo, whose video was morphed online with another Instagram user's video and her face was morphed in that video and and like there was action taken by the police and like she there was a lot of, uh, you know, she did face, she could actually face a lot of, the video went viral and she faced a lot of harassment online and then she had it, she did file a case in next to the police but we still have uh, this problem where a lot of unregulated media gets released and due to that particular reason uh, women sometimes women because of the nature of the content that's released when their photos are mobbed they tend to not speak about it online or they tend to not complain because they don't want attention being brought into it now that cannot for example the uh, example of the actress which i gave uh, it is just to relate to how this kind of issues are happening right now but not everyone is willing to speak up about it now as i mentioned before the absence of an actual guardian so when you talk about the routine activities theory we can understand that uh, uh like if you're like when you're talking about in real life you can understand that like if you're accompanied with someone and if you are uh may, may that be your friend or someone to accompany you when you're outside there's less lesser chance of you being a victim of a crime but on the online sphere because you're alone and since you are a lone user and like you represent yourself that's where uh you know it can lead to like increased crimes um and uh i'm sorry oh uh, yeah um, and these crimes can be uh, perpetuated by anonymous users who may have been victims of cyber bullying or harassment and um, the reason i chose these um, theories of crime is because they can be applied to cyber crimes to develop an understanding of why such crimes occurs and how to prevent them by establishing a prom proper theoretical framework ma'am so that's my presentation so Right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Navya. It was a good presentation. Uh, I specifically liked the application of theories part. Uh, I just had one question. So what you have portrayed um, seems quite fine at an abstract level. But um, have you gone through the jurisdictional differences? So when you say... Um, See, on the issue of anonymity or you generally say that this is how law has been uh, but then um, we have seen progress uh, in some jurisdictions right with regards to cyber crime say for instance in europe um, and uh, the same may not have been happened in other jurisdiction so uh, how do you view this jurisdictional differences and uh, what is your take on it uh, yes, ma'am. So um, right now, uh, the scope of my paper does not explore the jurisdictional aspects, but I have actually gone through uh, some material related to that. And like, um, see, data privacy and protection, it covers a wide ambit. So in India, we do have the IT Act and certain provisions related to that. Like, they don't, they're not specifically for women, but then if you're violating the privacy or dignity of like any individual online or like publishing any material uh, anonymously, we, we do have laws related to that. But uh, because of the problems like deep fakes and AI generated content rising, uh, we, st we still haven't covered that because right now on social media platforms, you can manipulate the vo voice of an individual to sound like that person is saying something, which can actually adversely affect women or even like using their photos to create AI generated pictures. I think these areas need to be regulated better because the IT Act provisions are more limited to um, the Information Technology Act. The, the provisions are more related to like like it's like more of like a niche because the act is covered like how you're if you're a basic user online how to, how can you like you know what the law is protecting you it's covering that but but right now uh because of the rise in like um ai generated content and like um those aspects which can actually adversely affect specifically women because the reason um you know they are targeted only because they are women so i feel like there needs to be some regulation related to that and um looking at other jurisdiction do we do have like uh, laws related to your data protection and like you know privacy in like the europe uh, and like other countries so in that way i think there is still some uh, uh, regulation need to be happening in like specifically ai generated content in that area that's what like deep fakes and yeah okay like okay that. okay yes, thank you navia thank you for your presentation thank you. yes thank you so much
ma'am am i audible uh yes is this samhita you are audible but i can't see you uh, ma'am uh, just a minute ma'am i'll just share my screen and turn on my video sure Shantanu, if you are saying something, you are not audible to us. Audible, ma'am. Audible, ma'am. Ah, uh, ma'am, am I visible and audible? Yes, yes. Now you are. Ah, uh, ma'am, uh, can I start? Like, yes. Ah, uh, Shantanu, are we good to go? Ah, uh, audible right now, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Now, now you are. Okay. Should so we start? I just. I just wanted to remind you that in the Excel sheet there's a score sheet. So after every presentation, you can mark the participants according to your criteria. Sure, sure. Yes. Thank you so much, ma'am. You can go ahead, Samit. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. So myself, Samit, I am from Christ Deemed to Be University. So my topic is regarding deep fakes and privacy. So. Uh, I would like to start my presentation by giving an insight of what the meaning is, or what the deep fix actually mean. So deep fix is something like uh, it. It basically tells like how uh, an artificial intelligence can make videos out of a person, videos, images, texts, or any such messages or something. So uh, I can also tell that how these deep fix are actually started. How can we actually Uh, generate such an image, videos, or text, or audio messages as such is something which we have to look into. Uh, the uh, concept of generative adversarial machine and network. So this is a kind of a uh, platform where we can generate all these kind of uh, images, te text, audio of any person resembling the same as if he has told it. So and this same way, deepfakes are somewhere interrelated to privacy. That it's all done without the consent of another person. That we we are not asking the permission of the person or consent into it, and we are just creating or mobbing another person's picture or uh, image or something as such. So this would affect directly the privacy aspect, uh, which was again explained uh, in IT Act, but uh, not per se saying that deepfakes will have a violation, but uh, somewhere. Uh, it the people who has actually the aggrieved party here that is the consent that is the first and the foremost uh, requirement here that the consent has not been taken and which is basically violating the fundamental rights also and uh, they have to make sure that consent has to be also taken so the role of intermediaries also play a, ma a major role here uh, considering that the in intermediaries are also governed under this it uh, reasonable securities and uh, reasonable securities and uh, i'm not able to full remember the full uh, uh, provision as such so uh, under the rule 3 of the provision it also specifies the uh, intermediaries what are the offenses that they're not supposed to uh, commit and if they actually commit such an offense it would lead to violation and they would be having penalty as such for the uh, violation that they have actually caused and we have to also consider the legal considerations here that is to say what uh, that what are all the laws that is applicable and as of now we have no stringent laws for deep fakes and that is the issue which is recently going on uh, one of the famous actor uh, recently was mobbed by one of the pictures on instagram and other via social media platforms and all so in that way uh, we there are no stringent laws so this would be somewhere impacting the uh, uh, society that there's no legal structure or no legal pattern as such or no stringent laws for governing such a deep fakes other than the it act and um, coming to the reputation obviously if such a things happen reputation of the person will all obviously be spoiled and they would never come front uh, to actually make sure that this issue will be sorted like sometimes who people dare to come front and make sure that okay if i don't mind if my attention is gained or not it's the that's the secondary but i make sure that my reputation is at not at stake or something as such then next coming to the authenticity like uh people are uh, now uh, having known very many websites that they are, uh, they are authentic and everything and they make sure they click the link that to make sure that they generate such idea of uh, the text message audios and everything so this also makes sure that this is violating the privacy aspect and there's no credibility also in 
the intermediaries if they do not actually follow the IT rules and IT Act, uh, uh, the provisions, whatever they have given. So coming next that uh, how this is the same that I have written here also that how the reputation consent and everything will go on and what are all the risks which is associated with this deep fakes. So the risks can be uh, can be classified like into three ways like political, financial and um, the gender. So coming to the gender aspect, uh, we can see that not just girls, even boys can also be affected by such a kind of a deep fakes uh, issue. So that also should be taken into, con into consideration. And when it comes to financial risks, it's not only applying to gender bias, like a boy, girl or something like that. Even financial scams can also happen by generating all these kind of audios or even even the, even those text messages also. And uh, coming to this, uh, finan uh, other than financial and gender, and other political scams are also happening that, uh, that this person is stand for this one and other things like that. So political, gender, and financial are also three risks which we have to take into consideration apart from the other risks, like individual risks, like uh, affecting a person as such. Then uh, what are the laws surrounding it? Like what, what were the laws that as of now, as there's no stringent laws, the laws now which are actually coming under the purview of deep fix, we can somehow say constructively that 66D of the IT Act, which specifically informs that uh, violation of any such... Uh, uh, privacy like there should not be violation of any such privacy as such uh, that is punishment for cheating by person personation that is by using computer audio text and messages and everything and here rule three clause one of the uh, it rules 2011 also specifies that uh, there should be reasonable efforts which shall be made by the intermediaries to make sure that uh, we have to const we have to constructively uh, hold the data of the people and data of fiduciary and data principle also play a main role when intermediaries are transferring the data from one person to another or from maybe like a, an organization to another organization as such. And we have to also take into consideration uh, that these data of uh, fiduciaries uh, consent is also taken and uh, data principles permission is also taken that is the consent so that these data fiduciaries can actually uh, trust these organizations to pass on such an information of their choice which was asked that can be either voluntarily or through a compulsion like which is required by law that you are supposed to give or voluntary as such like you coming up as a witness or just giving the information as such. So next we can also talk about the 66 and 67A and 67B of the IT Act, which prohibits and prescribes the punishment if something, these kind of obscene material, or if by chance, if there is any such kind of situations where uh, there are published of any such audio text of uh, text messages or audio video messages as such, if it's published on a platform where, um, which is not known to another person, and uh, there prescribes a punishment for such kind of people also. And uh, we can, I can also add on to a suggestion saying that uh, we have to cover uh, the more punishments aspect in when we are considering for framework of these deep fakes, uh, deep fakes, I mean, technology as such, because uh, here we have to look into all the kinds of scams, not just like gender, financial, or uh, you know, what a political or individual's personal right. Everybody's person uh, uh, consent, I mean, everybody should be taken into consideration so that uh, these don't happen anymore in future and something like that. And uh, I feel that IT Act, whatever the rules are there, they should be more more uh, narrow and little and have to give strict interpretation as such that these should be the people who should be actually given punishment for if they have committed such an offense and uh, their punishment should be i think it shall be harsher because the reputation of the person is at stake and at the same time the consent is not being taken he might be a well reputed person again so everything is gone down and uh, i feel that all these uh, suggestions somewhere might help in framing of new laws. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Samita. Uh, a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, you have compared and you have, uh, you know, brought two aspects together. First of deep fake. Yes, ma'am. First uh, on intermediary liability. Yes, ma'am. Right. But um, I agree that particularly when it comes to individual risk, privacy plays a major role. 
right? But if you see the ramification of deep fake, uh, you know, it, it's as large as it could affect international relations as well. Yes. Right? So intermediary liability is one thing, privacy is one thing, and the ramifications, you know, you have talked about having stringent punishments. And ramifications on different uh, entities could be Entity. individual, could be a group of individuals. So considering all this, and because you have majorly focused on the IT Act, um, do you feel that uh, we need um, some kind of a dedicated legislation or the existing legislation in its present form uh, would able to manage the situation? Ma'am, I feel that considering now this is a situation presently, so we have to also take into uh, the account of what the IT rules also, IT Act, what the punishments are also given. And we have to add on more punishments also, like by framing more stringent laws, like a new dedicated, as you asked, a new dedicated legislation. I feel, yeah, it is it is a need for the parliament to actually create a new legislation as such because if this is left alone right now i don't think it would uh, be you know it would be a debate in the uh, parliament very sure that there are no stringent laws and there's no application of any such this one uh, there's no specification of intermediaries and everything the concept why it related intermediaries and privacy and deep fakes is because somewhere uh, we can't say only persons or in uh, can violate such deep fakes and do a uh, mimicking of other people or uh, mobbing and all but mm -hmm. uh, we can also see intermediaries also can do uh, all such kind of platforms and you can utilize and you know, make sure that even these persons' privacy are also taken off or something like that. That's what my... Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Samita. So I'd like to call upon the next presenter, Nivedita and Ramal. Yes, you are. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, myself, Samir Devi, and my co author, Nira Dipa, will be presenting today. So starting with, in our contemporary era, transgender and gender diverse individuals find themselves among the marginalized groups of society. So they go through sharp levels of discrimination and bullying, like both in face-to-face -face interaction and in online. So the online discrimination or abuse which they face, which consists of a cyber bullying and morphing, or uh, uh, showing them obscene content and other serious offenses. But these offenses are not being addressed 
So that's what our research paper analysis through. So our paper titled The Global Perspective on Gender Inclusivity in Technology Assessment and Pathways Forward. Moving forward, so there is no legal assurance in India concerning the cyberbullying or for anybody using social networking sites, much less for the LGBT community. So neither the Information Technology Act or certainly any other modification which is designed to shield the LGBT community from the online harassment. So there are some few ambiguous uh, anti-harassment policies in the Transgender Persons Protection of Rights Act. But however, it seems thoughtful in these laws would ever adequately enforce. So the individuals who belong to these marginalized sectors are not being protected against the cyberbullying by any cause within the ICC also, that is the Indian people. Uh, so that's what our research objectives are. The first is to like investigate the uh, diverse cyber dispute faced by the marginalized community, particularly LGBTQ plus community, which encompasses the cyber stalking, morphing, pornography, and defects. And also the examine the existing legal frameworks to identify the gaps in addressing the unique challenge faced by the LGBTQ community. And lastly, the, we assess the impact of the legal vacuum of the online experience. And also we assess the well-being of the LGBTQ with uh, the help of other countries' mechanism in order to enhance the uh, digital protection uh, So I'll be dealing with the research problem of this paper. So in this digital age, cyber disputes have emerged as a significant concern, particularly for the marginalized communities, as such, the LGBTQ community. So these community people who are frequently perceived as vulnerable or who frequently face cyber crimes are particularly vulnerable to the emerging kinds of abuse and assault, including cyber stalking, morphing, pornography, and deep fakes. So in India, the gender minorities are among the most susceptible demography and are frequently targets of cyber bullying. So despite the increasing prevalence of these disputes, there appears to be a lack of comprehensive legal frameworks that specifically address uh, and protect the digital rights and the safety of LGBTQ people. So in this research paper, we will delve into the conceptual framework that shed lights on the relationship between gender and technology. So the aim is to explore the legal ramification associated with the crimes against gender minority in cyberspace. So the research uh, analyzes the existing legal mechanisms which uh, uh, for uh, and also for addressing disputes and the potential avenues for developing effective legal frameworks to mitigate the online harm and protect LGBTQ people rights. So, so, so the first chapter is regarding the cyber crime impact on the gender minority. So the one notable crime regarding the transgender individuals is cyber bullying. Uh, for we saw it can hear the recent news an Indian makeup artist who has died, suspects suicide at age of 16, being uh, subjected to online attacks. So, <clears throat> frequently incidents similar to this occur in India. But the cyber threat doesn't look over these and also they grow a measure to address them. <clears throat> so, the suicide rate and suicide tendency among the trans in the community have been reported in comparative to the gender po general population. The current uh, sexual harassment laws do not protect the marginalized genders from the online workplace harassment, and they also need to include uh, uh, sexual harassment laws in this current law process. Next, cybercrime, which is prevalent in the current digital era, is that hate. Other various financial aspects of digitalization, such as connectivity, sharing their uh, personal stuff, knowledge, supporting social relationships, are the positive, but still, they are a whole negative side of this hate crime. So, we here insist that. The legislation also support the victims of the cyber hate. And the another important point to note here is that even uh, there's a dedicated cyber crime portal in India, provision exists for reporting offenses for women and children. But we could see the noticeable absence of specific provision for individuals who identify gender, themselves as a third gender. So we see here that there's a legislation gap which highlights the need for inclusion of a legal framework that comprehensively address the human challenges faced by the transgender individuals in India. So moving on to the next part, Indian legal framework governing cyber crimes against LGBTQ community. So although there are currently existing notable advancements in Indian recognition of the rights of LGBTQ, Yet, uh, there is still a serious lack of specific legislation and regulations about the cyber crimes that predate these communities. So, personally, there are, personally, there are any explicit statutes regulating crimes towards uh, this community. 
So the present framework of law largely deals with generalized cyber crimes. However, it does not work to tackle the special issues encountered by the LGBTQ population. For example, cyber bullying and online harassment, including hate speech that are thrown at LGBTQ individuals, frequently remain unresolved and simply because of the lack of explicitity. So the rise of social media as well as online platforms has led to an increase in the cyber crimes against marginalized communities, including the LGBTQ individuals. So moving on, uh, the Information Technology Act uh, 2000, which uh, majorly covers uh, provisions dealing with safeguarding of users in the cyberspace, for example, uh, Section 66 that deals with hacking or computer-related offenses. Section 66A, which deals with the punishment for sending offensive messages. And uh, Section 66C, that deals with identity threat, cheating by imperson uh, impersonation, uh, dealt in Section 66D. Violation of privacy, uh, as in Section 66E. Uh, transmission of obscene material under Section 67 and publication or uh, transmission of material containing sexually explicit act in electronic form as in uh, delve into the 67A and 67B. These are all, each of the cyber crimes uh, here in it is punishable with imprisonment for a period of that may extend like either to three years or five years as uh, given in Section 77B. But in all of these uh, sections that involve, there aren't any gender neutral laws uh, in all of these sections. And India does not have any statute that specifically safeguard the individual from cyberbullying. Section 67 uh, concerning this act, it nevertheless addresses cyberbullying to a certain degree. And in addition to this, uh, there is also National Cyber Crime Reporting Portal, which enables cit citizens to report claims for uh, uh, complaints pertaining to cyber crimes. But in this option also, there is only binary gender specified in the complaint, but not a gender neutral uh, uh, section given in the uh, uh, space of gender. And moving on to the Indian Penal Code 1860, Section 354C, it defines the offense of voyeurism, which involves capturing or disseminating images of a woman engaged in a private act without her consent. And this offense is a non, non bailable offense. And the uh, perpetrator will be uh, faced with a fine and imprisonment up to three years. And also section 354D that addresses the offense of stalking, including cyber stalking. In this case, also the uh, perpetrator may face punishment of three years uh, and also a fine or both. In both of these cases, it is ex uh, uh, explicitly for the women, but it is not a gender neutral se uh, section as in its face. And additionally, there are also uh, uh, many uh, no uh, uh, national or international rule or policy that uh, that uh, requires in safeguarding the users uh, in the internet uh, in the uh, I'm sorry in the web. So uh, and also moving on the infringement of Articles 14 and 21, which guarantees equal rights to all the people, and Articles 51A, uh, Clause E, and Clause H, which upholds the basic obligation of fostering peace. And the principles of investigation and transformation will also be infringed in the case of LGBTQ community. And also um, uh, dealing with two of the uh, uh, landmark judgments, the Nalsar case and the Navjot uh, Johar case, which legalized the legitimate uh, relationship between the same sex. In uh, 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 the, uh, These are also one of the uh, landmark judgments that provides rights to the LGBTQ community. So at present, legal framework fails to sufficiently uh, safeguard the LGBTQ people uh, based on their gender. Although it addresses cyber crimes, as in, in the IT Act, it fails to specifically take into account the variety of identities or the gender that exists in the LGBTQ population. Uh, moving on to the uh, global aspect. So we can see in the United States, uh, there, has, there is no federal regulation that prohibits cyberbullying. So most of the states nevertheless have several additional regulations which may give safeguarding to it. And across, you can see 48 US states Cyberbullying is express, expressly included uh, under computer violence regulation, and cyberbullying is criminally punishable in 44 states. So subsequently, also it becomes simpler for adolescents and teenage, uh, teenagers to bring an action against the perpetrators in any kind of civil court. The, this is due to the National Crime Prevention Council that is uh, established by the statute. So global, globally, regulation against cyber crime are, are placed in certain nations such as Canada, New Zealand, and Japan, but the rules against sexual harassment and cyber stalking uh, might also be applicable in other nations as well. So, number of nations have designed cyber harassment considered an instance of abuse against children. 
and also uh, anybody found accused for cyber bullying others uh, uh, anyone uh, accused for cyber bullying they face criminal penalties and we can see in accordance to the 2018 research uh, that uh, by the Ita uh, in italy and sweden it has a greater uh, perception rate of cyber bullying globally with regard to the us there are two uh, statutes with deals with the uh, specific of uh, cyber uh, cyber disputes and cyber crimes uh, with especially to the marginalized communities. One is the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act 2009, and the other one is Equality Act. But in, this act is still in the uh, uh, par parliament and it, it has not been passed yet. But if this act comes into place, it will be a major uh, changing for the entire LGBTQ community in the uh, um, in USA. Uh, so, as time's been up, I, I just Say, say the findings and the other two minutes. Uh, I just like to interrupt. Okay. Time is up, so can you just yes, make a concluding statement? Yeah, yeah, so we could see as in the US, that's, uh, that's a European Cyber Crime Center in Europe also, which is like primary goal to safeguard the citizens, business, and other criminal activities. So, like, Moving to the findings and suggestions. So we could see that the main findings of this is that like we have to, uh, there's an exclusion of gender minorities in legislation as a distinct gender indicates the uh, increased likelihood of victimization of LGBTQ community. So it highlights the importance to include the sexuality and gender minority individuals. So despite there have been various problems throughout our country, there is still gaps like we have to in issues like non-exclusivity. So mainly we say that while some other countries have policies regarding this, but none of them achieved a flawless legislation in this regard. So, however, the fact that other countries have made an attempt, but we haven't still made an attempt to include these. So, it implies that we can learn from other countries' experience and we have to strive to act, enact similar measures. So, the suggestions I would like say is the three B3. The first suggestion would be to develop a legislation which includes the transgender individuals in real life cyber crime. Uh, as, why? Because there's no clearly mentioned gender identity or expression in any of the legislations. So this could uh, result in strict uh, enforcement of law only based on the written law, written laws. So the suggestion is to like update the laws for the cyber stalking, bullying, harassment, uh, discrimination, with especially those who uh, affect the marginalized community. Secondly, generating reports or surveys. As we could receive, we could see there were no reports or surveys regarding cyber bullying or hate crimes specifically for the LGBT community. So the first step is to we have to like generate reports and surveys. Then only we could know that this much crime has happened so that we could bring out the legislation. With the next suggestions, uh, so uh, I'll, I'll take a this. So, uh, adding on to that, there can also be an action item wherein the people of the LGBTQ community can voice their issues through an official channel. And also, one uh, thing, the online help, uh, helpline will also be a major interest for this. So, in this way, uh, uh, deeper uh, 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 understand the need for competent legal frames to cyber dispute uh, target LGBTQ community. And also, it can prevent the most nature of online harassment, discrimination, and hate speech, which not only undermine the well being and safety of LGBTQ users, but also offer to make systemic inequalities in digital space. So by addressing legal rights surrounding the digital, uh, sorry, side again the LGBT community, stakeholders can hold fundamental rights, promote social justice, contribute to the creation of safer and more suitable digital space for individuals. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation, Nivedita and Ramya. It was uh, very interesting and very comprehensive. Um, the time is uh, already up, um, so I won't ask too many questions. Just one quick question. If you can be, uh, just give me some specific example. Um, you know, you have given examples of different countries uh, for US, US, Japan, etc. Uh, but uh, if you can point out to specific provision vis-a-vis uh, -vis any Indian law, you know, and, and how it could be altered if something clicks to you. Uh, so if you could see, like, if we uh, define gender, it's like male, female. Even though we go to the complaint, cyber complaint portal, we could only see women and children. There is no, like, provision for giving transgender or any other, uh, like, 
uh, any other sexuality been included in the laws as well as in the uh, uh, crime portal also. So we think that, like for example, even in IPC, uh, we could see the new bill which brings defines gender, including third gender. So, so I think even the many other legislation for in, in bringing in IPC. So very in, in even though in IT tech, in IT Act and other legislation, we have to bring in that term gender, expand the gender definition, and also for the uh, for crime reporting, we have to include the third gender. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Nivedita and Ramya. Yes. Uh, hi. So I'd like to call upon the next presenters, Arsha Badwa and Yasir Said Arbi. Uh, hello. Uh, uh, could we uh, take a minute to just uh, present our screen? I'm Uh, good afternoon. Is it visible? Uh, yes, yes, it is. All right. I will be starting. Uh, uh, good afternoon to our present here. My name is Arsha Vadva and I'm a student of law at uh, Opijindal Global University. I, along with my colleague Yasir uh, Sayed Alvi, who is also a law student at the same university, will now be presenting under the theme of health and gender tech disparities. In accordance with the theme that we have chosen, our paper deals with contemporary social legal discussions surrounding the use of gene editing technologies and their unethical potentialities. Having said that, we have titled our paper, Legal Vacuum in Gene Editing Technology and Its Gendered Impact, Navigating the Ethical Frontier. Uh, the research problem that we have proposed is that what are the ethical concerns of gene editing technologies, especially in the pretext of gender-based discrimination, and how can proper regulations encapsulate and eliminate its misuse? Our methodology deals with the fact that we started with the paper by introducing the essential problem with gene editing uh, technology. Further, we analyze the issue through qualitative and quantitative research through various uh, through uh, by accessing various sources such as journals, articles, scholarly blogs, which provided us with abundance of social legal data to support our arguments when it comes to utility. Through this research, we have identified the relevant gaps in the contemporary literature surrounding this issue, and suggested a temp tentative uh, and suggested tentative frameworks that could curb this issue. Uh, in uh, few, uh, uh, in the future. So the first heading that we have given to our paper and primarily spoken about is the encap by, in in by encapsulating the harrowing dilemmas proposed by the gene editing technology. The entire uh, um, intention since, behind- Sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I'm not able to see the screen. It's just one blank PPT, which I can see. Uh, okay. Probably it's not moving. Is it visible now? Yes. Okay. 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 Uh, okay, so the entire intention behind having a technology supporting the editing of genes was to reduce genetic diseases that people have to suffer through. 
CRISPR is one such technology. Clustered regulatory interspace short palindromic repeats, the full form, is one such technology getting its fame due to this essential feature that it possesses. Nonetheless, there are some harrowing concerns attached to this technology if used in an unregulated manner, leading to unethical practices. This technology can be used for some other purposes in humans as well. And this will be in, uh, explained in a twofold manner. Firstly, um, the tech can be used for some other purposes in humans, such as editing those genes of unborn children, which uh, has the possibility of enhancing or modifying their physical attributes or cognitive capabilities. The possibility of a new set of beauty standards being creative in an already disruptive system can lead to a creation of something called as designer babies. Secondly, the aspect of determination of sex before birth is also possible through this technology, and this will be explained in detail further. Now, we all know prenatal sex determination in India is illegal, but this technology is such that, in our opinion, has the possibility of enabling this illegal practice to take place knowingly or unknowingly, as we will see in detail. The relevance of discussing this in India's context today grows as public discourse has already took place of bringing this technology forth. We do have certain laws in India prohibiting the malified intentions of these gene editing technologies and its horrors, but are they enough and efficient? That is extremely debatable and its effic efficacy will be laid out further. Now my colleague will be explaining uh, the technical aspects of the technology and its severe implications. Uh, just, okay. Fine. You're on slide number four, right? Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you, Asha. Greetings, everyone. I am Yasu Saeed Alvi, and I shall be taking the presentation forward from here. Uh, so, a singular, uh, as you can see at the title, that the scientific validation of cosmetic beauty extrapolating the Indian context. So, um, while researching on the topic, we came to the understanding that gene editing technologies are revolutionary in essence with respect to curing long held generational illnesses. That's settled. However, uh, they also hold the potential of altering the physical makeup to make what scientists have come to call designer babies. Uh, so from this, it follows that uh, the ability can be used, can be utilized to make you to change the way the future baby would eventually look. Uh, in societies that obsess over conventional beauty standards, which most certainly includes the Indian society, considering we're so obsessed with Western markers of beauty. Uh, this scientific potential can be used to ensure that babies conform to the beauty standards that such societies look up to. Using technology developed for critical medical motives for cosmetic satisfaction to enhance the beauty points of future babies will allow the unprincipled scientific valid cosmetic beauty standards among human beings. Moving further, glamorizing beauty fashion, cosmetics, and the media influence. The effect uh, that mass media and partially social media has on the social order has been decently intense to allow these standards to set deep into the Indian societal mindset. Um, the way manufacturing advertisements that represent impractical and unrealistic images of bodies that are done as models in either magazines, television, social media, and other forms of mass media has created deep-rooted beauty obsessions in India. There is no denying the fact that the standards of beauty that are created in every society have an invariably vigorous impact on the women of that society. CRISPR holds the potential to lighten skin tones, change the makeup of eyes and their subsequent color. Similarly, it can also alter the height of the baby. Hence, we premise this portion of the paper on this such technologies may be used for conforming to beauty standards, especially with respect to women who have to face the extraordinary brunt of such social orders surrounding beauty. Um, further, challenging the underestimation of sex determination tendency. So this uh, particular area, this discourse uh, surrounds the ethical concerns with gene modification therapies. Uh, that encompass the future ability of technologies like in vitro fertilization for that matter to pave the way for select um, biological sex alongside their cerebral capacity, height and physical strength, etc. IVF holds the possibility of sex-focused selection in the future and the introduction of gene editing will further ease the 
uh, will further the ease of creating uh, what scientists have come to call designer babies, which is concerning because it will push further the sexist approach of birthing babies uh, that we're pretty familiar with. Uh, research in the area demonstrates the growing ability of biotechnology reproduction. Um, in, what's, in, in one such research, CRISPR was utilized to choose the sex of mouse pups. Uh, so wherein the methodology that was utilized by scientists uh, selectively killed the embryos of a specific sex, allowing uh, the other ones to survive, therefore directly deciding which sex can be given life. So for time being, um, CRISPR edits are not regarded as feasible to use with respect to human reproduction considering the process, be it legal, social, ethical, scientific, and so on. However, scientists have, uh, scientists believe that the possibility of it being used for humans in the future is a dangerous indication. Um, further, CRISPR's prowess to amplify human cognitive potential. Now, uh, we've understand what we've understood what gene editing is capable of. So one such uh, understanding is that CRISPR has a clear capability to increase the cognitive capacity of future human beings by leaps and bounds. So in favor of the technology, find motivation in creating what we've come to call super intelligent humans that are extremely high functioning individuals. Uh, and this will prove to be detrimental for the reason that this person will almost always outperform uh, the natural human being. On the flip side of things, society will never be tolerant of the acumen of such a person and will subject them to active genetic discrimination by disallowing such a person from being considered at par with the naturals. This will simply be an object of surveillance, will outrightly breach their human rights to privacy and equal treatment, which will in turn enable a questionable treatment of such a person by the society. Now I request my colleague Arsha to take the presentation forward. Uh, thank you, Yasser. Now that we have glanced at the technical consequences of this tech, let us look at what the law has to say. India has ethical guidelines known as the National Ethical Guidelines for Biomedical and Health Research, which mention the existence of such eugenic gene editing and its unethical use. However, India does not has not proposed any specific regulatory frameworks when CRISPR is concerned and mere guidelines may not be sufficient to annihilate the possible misuses that could occur through CRISPR or any other gene editing technology. Thus, a statute entailing the constitutional uh, principles of equality, right against discrimination, social justice, and right to life must be enshrined in the future statutory frameworks that are to be built in context to the gene editing technologies addressing its unique facets. Uh, we have attached a meme here. Uh, now looking at the international angle, an international summit on human gene editing was hosted by the United States in December 2015, along with other nations, which laid out certain suggestions in their report extending to the restrictions on the clinical trials of gene editing technologies the, that countries must adhere to, such as preventing only serious diseases, oversight of procedure of health and safety, participating in clinic of uh, participants of the clinical trials, and respecting the uh, transparency and privacy of patients, and so on. Additionally, in terms of international recognition, the Universal Declaration on the Human Genome and Human Rights condemns the unethical use of practices which contravenes human dignity or performs reproductive cloning of humans under Article 12. These terms are broadly defined, thus the aspect of gene editing can be incorporated and inculcated by our understanding in our laws. From this, we can gather that the exact measures to tackle the issue that we have presented are not explicitly given recognition uh, by the international legal system either. Nonetheless, the recommendations surrounding this technology and its potential misuses are also beneficial for us to analyze and incorporate according to our social context. Uh, Yasser will now be concluding the presentation. Uh, thank you, Archa. Uh, this basically, uh, this conclusion underscores the dual nature of, as we saw during the course of the presentation. Uh, we acknowledge their pivotal role in life-saving advancements while emphasizing ethical considerations. So our paper advocates for a framework that balances technological progress with ethical boundaries, 
particularly in gene editing technologies like CRISPR. Uh, critiques are raised against potential misuses advocating for preemptive legal frameworks to prevent future abuses. While recognizing the promise of gene editing in eradicating genetic district international and domestic legal structures to govern these technologies, highlighting the need for a robust enforcement from their very inception. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you so much, Yasir Nasha, for your presentation. Um, I have two quick questions. Firstly, when you talk about this CRISP uh, our technology, um, do you think it is patented? Does it have uh, Does it have any relation to patent laws? And uh, and you say it has ethical implications, which you have very nicely pointed out. Um, would patent laws or can patent laws, existing patent laws, cater to that ethical implications? And secondly, um, on a very abstract level, you are saying that there are legal ethical challenges and we need a strong legal framework, right? Um, so when you say a strong legal framework, can you point to any specific legislations in which you want to see that framework? Uh, yes, Professor. So uh, China developed uh, CRISPR, but uh, there are a few patents covering uh, like the, uh, the the patents over CRISPR. However, I'm a little unsure about the ethical implications that that it, that is there with the, the patent laws and CRISPR because we didn't really delve into the IPR uh, part of our paper. We really just wanted to tackle uh, like which is only on the socio-ethical front and gender discrimination that comes along with CRISPR. Uh, could you please repeat the second question that you have? So my second question is, uh, what specific legislations you can point out to when you say there has to be a change in framework to address these social legal ethical challenges? Can you point out to some specific legislation? Or do you have something uh, in mind? Yeah. Uh, Professor, the only thing that came into mind when I was researching this was the guidelines that we had uh, come up with, the ethical guidelines that were there. Any specific leg legislation even surrounding this was not really in the uh, purview of our ambit when we were considering this topic. So we are sort of trying to uh, like adhere to, we're taking from the international community, we're taking from these guidelines to have a legislation, maybe a new regulatory framework to be developed, which caters to this particular technology uh, significantly and separately. If Yasser would like to add on to something. Um, understandably so, uh, considering the fact that uh, India has very specifically outlawed, uh, outlawed um, you know, sex selection technologies and capabilities and to uh, CRISPR's technological advancement does fall under that. However, our ultimate aim here is to ensure that, you know, there is an outright, uh, you know, uh, outright statutory provision, uh, you know, uh, brings into uh, law these guidelines that have been proposed by the international community uh, over time. Uh, considering these technologies hold a lot of potential uh, and with that potential comes a lot of uh, responsibility. So if we uh, introduce these technologies, we, uh, as much as we understand that sex selection is outlawed, we would, uh, you know, basically the aim that we have with this paper is to, you know, push towards a specific statute that outlaws it, considering how potentially dangerous it is. Okay, thank you. Thank you, both of you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to call upon the next presenter, Ankita Jha. Yes, you're both audible and visible. I just share my screen. Good afternoon, everybody present. I am Ankita Jha from Xavier Law School, Kolkata. And today I aim to bring your attention towards and discuss the phenomenon of media trials. Through a qualitative study, I aim to study how media trial acts as a new witch, new age witch hunt for women under the scrutiny. 
In today's society, the media holds a very powerful role in shaping the public opinion and influencing societal norms. Media is termed as the fourth pillar of democracy because of being armed with the power of shaping the public's knowledge and opinion about a certain string of events. Unfortunately, the scholars have repeatedly found that the media's presentation of information about crime can often be fallacious and misleading. Research has also shown us that media often, often portrays women in a biased and stereotypical manner, reinforcing harmful gender norms and perpetuating research. But what is the media tribe? In today's digitized world, where media has substantial power to construct and perpetuate gendered narratives, they can also manipulate audience emotions by depicting individuals in a certain light, which may not often be true and may align with existing societal norms, thus reinforcing harmful stereotypes. The media, it is often argued that they present a distorted reality with images of crime that are not, not always accurate. Journalists are also humans who may carry their biases in their line of work reflected upon the text they produce. Cultural studies present that shared meanings are what represents cultures. Mass culture like literature, art, publishing, music, every day has a, life, has a majority control over the lives of ordinary people. And this holds the power of swaying mindsets through the global medium of media. If the majority is appeased by a patriarchal anti-feminist viewpoint, which somehow shines a negative light on the women who do not conform to the image of the ideal victim, that is the content which is going to be mass-produced and promoted. A victim grabs the media's undivided attention when they can be portrayed as the ideal victim or as a person who can be given the complete and legitimate status of being a victim. The status is awarded to those who are perceived as vulnerable, uh, worthy of sympathy or compassion. Thus, flaws which are inherently unacceptable to, unacceptable to a civilized society or are a part of conversations in a harsh tone, such as people with a drug addiction, may not appear as an ideal victim to the public. In this sense, there exists a hierarchy of victimization, which is portrayed in the media. The term witch is often believed as somebody who can bring more misfortune or harm through non-physical means, means such as casting spells or exerting influence over others. The Salem witch trials uh, are a very popular witch trials which everybody knows about. They were a series of hearings and prosecutions of people accused of witchcraft in colonial Massachusetts between February 1692 and May 1692. For a year, many people, most of them women, were accused and executed with many more imprisoned. The events in Salem began in January 1692 when a group of young girls in the village of Salem began experiencing symptoms of fit, and the local doctor diagnosed the symptoms as consequences of witchcraft. Interestingly, one of the first three people who were accused and arrested for witchcraft was an enslaved woman owned by the local minister. This portrays a hierarchy of power. She confessed to practicing witchcraft and claimed that there were other witches in Salem, and this led to a lot of further accusations and arrests. The trials were characterized, as we can know, the, as we know, the character, they were trials were characterized by a lack of due, pro, due process and legal safeguards. The accused were often subjected to harsh integration methods. The trials reflected social tensions within the community, with many of the accused being outsiders or marginalized members of the society. And at this point, I need to bring your attention back to the concept of an ideal victim, which also excludes outsiders. The trials did reach a climax when the governor of Massachusetts intervened. But however, since then, the Salem witch trials have remained a symbol of the powers, the abuse of power, the danger of mass hysteria, and religious extremism. We come down to examining the media trials of Amber Heard and Rhea Chakraborty. We are confronted with stark examples of gendered lens through which the such cases are portrayed. The case of Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard was a globally well-known case, which was a matter of defamation between the formerly married actors. However, Amber Heard was the one who was brutally dragged online throughout the trial, with a large number of memes and jokes being made at her expense. She was heavily scrutinized for everything, from the expressions she laid out to the opinions she had on the words she used. Everybody had an opinion on everything. 
She was painted out to be a liar, a bipolar person, a cheat, and so much more. A view of death being the vulnerable victim and her being the abusive partner was very quickly solidified and so followed the evidence to support it. Many argue that it rolled, ba it rolled back the minor progress that the Me Too movement had made by disregarding the fact that the allegations of assault imposed on Depp were ruled to be proved were ruled to be proved and true by a British court in 2020. The public seemed to completely ignore that piece of information that the entire legal proceeding had already been carried out, which proved him to be an abusive husband. It was also reported that Daily Wire had spent thousands of dollars promoting fans and articles that largely favored death. Contrary to holding him guilty on the same standard that Amber Heard was held on to, crime of domestic violence was played out as a spectacle on social media with an extremely heavy and misogynistic narrative. We come down to a case from the other side of the globe but something cl close to us in 2020. A young actor from Bollywood, Sushant Singh Rajput, died by committing suicide. What should have sparked conversations about mental health and prevention of suicide instead became a witch trial about his former partner, Dia Chakraborty. Following his death, she became the subject of intense media scrutiny and public attention with various allegations and accusations made against her, which went as to as far as Rajput's family claiming that she performed black magic on him. He was, uh, she was targeted by lots of sections of the media and she was labeled as a gold digger and a drug peddler. We are talked about this case illustrates how women can be vilified and held responsible for events beyond their control. On the other hand, Amber Heard's case in particular highlights how women can be portrayed as the sole aggressors in abusive relationships, with little consideration for the complexities of such dynamics. These narratives perpetuate harmful stereotypes about women, but also fail to acknowledge the broader issue of intimate partner violence, which can affect, which can affect gen individuals of any gender. These cases underscore the need for a more nuanced, empathetic approach to media coverage. They highlight the importance of addressing gender bias in both media and society at large. Women should not be disproportionately scrutinized or held to unrealistic standards of behavior, especially in situations where they themselves may be victims. By challenging, challenging these narratives and promoting a more inclusive and empathetic discourse, we can work towards a more just and equitable society for all. In conclusion, media trials do act as new age witch hunts for women under scrutiny, but they also remind us that there is a persistent gender bias in our society. And it is upon us to challenge those narratives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ankita. It was indeed a very interesting presentation. Uh, and a very interesting topic as well. Um, you have portrayed, uh, you know, very nicely, you know, from the history and in, even including the current examples, right? But then... Uh, I would like to hear more about the solution side. Um, it's it's interesting that you use the word empathy, right? Uh, now, but this is something which is very difficult to enforce. Uh, so what is your take on that, on a practical solution side? Uh, these are the changes, yes, this has to come, but how? So, ma'am, we understand that this is a very nuanced approach. It, it requires a very nuanced approach because from a legal perspective, it if the... Uh, if a media trial affects the trial, affects the judicial trial, then it can be uh, come under contempt of court, contempt of courts act, uh, section two c, nineteen seventy one. And but however, the people who are uh, being subjected to this, they also have a right to privacy and a right to fair trial without the judicial uh, bodies being affected by a media influence or uh, because of public pressure, right? However, for a practical approach, uh, in September 2023, last year itself, our CGI has asked for guidelines on media trials. However, on a very uh, basic level, how do we manage fundamental rights, even though they are not absolute, but they do have, a, uh, when a media has a uh, right to speech, but people also have a right to privacy and a right to fair trial. So it's, it's like balancing between two fundamental rights and saying which is correct. So I think uh, what does need to happen on a very practical approach is the media are the ones who need to take a step back into protecting people's privacy and just 
putting facts in front of the people. That's what the job of the media is. They have to present facts, not opinions. The opinions are something that the people need to make up for themselves. However, the media does not do that. And I think that's where we can start from, just presenting facts. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ankita. I'd like to call upon the next presenters, Vishalini and Manoj Arvin. Yeah. Am I audible and visible? Yes, you are. Yes. Yeah, thank you. My friend will be sharing the screen. Is that it's showing a blank screen. Yeah, also. Oh, Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, uh, the presentation topic is that media trial vis-a-vis -vis its interplay with media ethics in the 21st century. Uh, basically, the glaring research problem which emanates from this whole topic is this. We all know that much scholarly ink has been split, split on expounding upon the freedom of press and media in this contemporary scenario. And everything boils down to the extent to which the government can exercise control over the media press. The extent matters. This was even echoed by uh, Lawrence Lessig in his classic book, Code is Law, that is regarding the regulability of media. And in this research paper, we have ventured to look into the unpopular flip side of the freedom of speech, which is the media. As the previous presenter also had expounded upon the gendered perspective of it, the instant paper will be confined to the exploring the possibilities to shift from self-regulation to the governmental regulation of the media. So the research methodology adopted in this paper is doctrinal in nature, which subsumes an analysis of various articles, websites, blogs, and reports churned out by various organizations. Ranging from the highly contentious censorship weapon to the social media users and intermediaries by the government, and, and we all hear the narrative about Orwellian governance of that from the media from the media's perspective. And on the contrary, we see the problems like the popular narratives that the media can manufacture to an extent of distorting the constitutional visionary or even toppling the government itself. These all happen from the government's point of view. One of such powerful influences is the media trial, which has the potential to subvert the justice delivery mechanism of the nation itself. So this is especially conspicuous when we look at various high-profile cases where the TV channels uh, vie uh, for delivering their own verdict before the actual court delivers its own verdict. Such propaganda will always have the impacts on judges, albeit at a very subconscious level. If we look at the title of the paper itself, can you move to the previous slide? So if you look at the title of the paper itself, it has media ethics in its phraseology. Basically, media ethics is a form of reasonable restrictions. We have we all see the reasonable restrictions which are ancient under Article 19 plus 2, uh, which operate upon Article 19 one day. So media ethics is also a form of reasonable restrictions, which the media is circumscribed by in disseminating information to the public. Media ethics stand in straight contradiction to the media, uh, media trials and hence the relevance of this instant paper. Next slide, please. So we have to know the tremendous difference between the public interest matters and the matters that actually interest the public. And this distinction has been grossly overlooked and exploited to the core by the media, not all, but some media. So the freedom of press is very well subsumed under Article 19 of the Constitution. And like US Constitution, we do not have a separate provision which deal with the freedom of press per se. So this freedom flows from the right to freedom of speech under Article 19 So next slide, please.
Next one. I think oh, screen is the screen is happening screen now. Yeah. Next. Previous. Yeah. Thank you. So, adverting to the first chapter, what we have here is the constitutionality of media trials. We looked into whether it act prejudices the matters which are subjudice. So, I would argue at the very outset that the phrase me, trial by media itself is a misnomer, since the term trial is neither defined by CPC nor by CRPC. So, hence we can resort to the Black's Law Dictionary, which couches the definition of media trial as, quote unquote, Formal judicial examination of evidence and determination of legal claims in an adversary proceedings, which emphatically implies that trial is something which can happen in the courts alone. When a matter is subjudice, the media is not, media is not supposed to assume a superseding role in pronouncing upon the judgment uh, of the guilt or innocence of the accused. So what emanates from this is the tussle between the right to freedom of speech and the right to free trial of free, free and fair trial of the accused. So the Honorable Supreme Court also in the case of uh, Anukul Chandra Pradhan versus Indian of India held that the publicity which the media attaches to, to the cases should not jeopardize the presumption of presence of IQs, which is a cardinal principle in our criminal jurisprudence. Then we have also looked into the world phase in the media's role by encroaching into the matter of Earlier, the media and press were not under the pressure as such to push up its TRP ratings and sales, and so some solemnity and uh, so some deference was uh, paid to the journalistic ethics. So, in order that a matter to be subjudice, a mere registration of affairs is sufficient and the investigation should be proceeded. So, and then CJA, uh, CK, uh, YK Sabarwal also commented about the seriousness of media trial by stating that if this trend persists, there cannot be any conviction since the judges are themselves confused about the case by virtue of the verdict pronounced by the media. So, another perturbing aspect which merits attention is the paid news phenomenon, when around 60 to 70 percent of the TV content is either paid for or sponsored. This trend has gotten so pervasive and undermined the foundations of democracy even. The court even ruled against the sting operations conducted by media by creating a lopsided picture amongst the public about the issue at hand. So it cannot be gainsaid that media has fostered transparency into various uh, scams, mischievous matters thereby bringing business. So all I can hear is what you all know Harari in his uh, book or in his book 21 Lessons for 21st Century. He said that in a world deluged by misinformation, only the clarity is power. So we are not uh, we are not uh, uh, denying the fact that media has brought in uh, transparency into matters which were otherwise kept in the dark from the public. So, but with great power comes great responsibility. So, uh, given the extant regulatory framework of the media, uh, the questions still arise about whether we should sh the paradigm should shift from self-regulation to the actual governmental regulation by the media. So as Nani Balkiwala, uh, in, in all his astuteness opined, uh, democracy is, uh, is a ceaseless endeavor and not a safe harbor. And thus putting a reasonable leash on the media is also the need of the hour, as opposed to the popular narrative calling for media activism. From here, my friend shall take over. Uh, sorry, Vishalini, your voice is breaking. Uh, am I audible now, Mom? Oh, yes. yes. Thank you, Ma'am. Uh, thank you, Manoj, for uh, telling about the constitutionality of media trial. So, uh, we would be like, be looking into how media ethics plays its role in media trial as well as the judiciary's opinion on the trial. So when we look into the major media ethical principles which are actually like violated through media, they can be uh, brought into five major categories. The first one being about media buyers in accordance with accuracy and impartiality. It is expected from the media that the media should act Without any bias, their news should be accurate and also they need to be impartial. Here, media bias interplays with accuracy and impartiality through the concept of yellow journalism. So this revolves around increasing the TRP ratings through catchy headlines and fab.
Um, Vishalini, we lost you in between. So if you can just um, repeat what you said quickly. Oh, yeah. Audible now? Yes, slightly. You can be a little slow. Yes. Uh, so I was talking about how media bias interacts with accuracy and impartiality. So how uh, increasing of media ratings in media has actually impacted the accurate standard partiality in the world by the media. So this having media buyers interact with accuracy and impartiality. Uh, we also see that uh, either a media ethics principle is independence, which the media has to have in hand. Due to the process of sensationalizing a case, the influence is societal pull. So this often leads the media to lose its independence. So this is due to the changed commercial nature of the industry from its true democratic identity. So here, the true evaluation of facts by media trial op often helps in arriving at unbiased publications, but that might not be what the target audience wish for. So in these circumstances, the media gets influenced by various societal institutions like religion, gender, and political ideologies, thereby they lose their independence. And moving into the integrity, when independence and bias, non-biasness and impartiality are lost, obviously the integrity of the is also gets lost the nonsense for press and broadcasting says that the big integrity of media ethics is that they need to act in the interest of the public which is actually here sacrificed for which is actually here sacrificed for the uh, media trial uh, process which is sacrificed for the accuracy Oh, uh, yeah, your voice is breaking between if you, if you could just repeat last two seconds I've been talking about how integrity is affected due to media trial uh, yes, in, uh, media, basic media ethics principle is a uh, basic how international council for press and broadcasting states that Integrity is the basics of media ethics and that all media needs to act in the interest of the public. So this is something which has been uh, left out by the media due to its losing its independence as well as being impartial for creating its own TRP ratings. So with this, I moved into how effects of uh, how the uh, media trial affects judiciary. So here, the first one I talked about, the first one I would be talking about was about the psychological influence on judicial officers and then the accused's right to fair trial and also about the implications on contempt of court, which you have like already seen, how due to the pre how due to media trial publications, which actually uh, basically talks about the various interviews of the witnesses, the relatives of the victims and accused, this all creates a kind of... Uh, pressure on the judiciary's mindset or upon the judicial officers while deciding a case. So this makes that uh, this ends this ends in the judiciary or the judicial officer having a bias upon him and also creates a pressure on him to not exert that bias in his decisions, which is actually the end goal of the judiciary. And here, since the judicial officers are influenced by the bias, their right to fair trial of the accused is also impacted. So here the media actually uh, accu uh, puts the accused person's character into question, which actually leads in prejudging the action. In one of the Andhra Pradesh High Court's case in YV Hanumantra versus KR Pattabiraman. So here uh, the court held in... yes. So sorry to interrupt, but your time is up. So can you just uh, make the concluding statements? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Um, to basically how media trials self-regulating power of the media impacts impacts the media impacts the judiciary as a whole or the line person. So here we would say 
the basic actuality of self regulation is that any coverage which may endanger character assassination prejudice or the leakage of any classified information cannot be brought after self regulation so this uh, this has already been proven wrong by the media because self regulated gas of media has actually not helped in attaining the following of basic ethical principles so here the press council's norm of journalistic conduct also talks about the ways actions of the media that is not permissible to be controlled through self regulation so they say that any publication which forms a substantial risk of obstructing and prejudicing the due administration of justice cannot be brought under the ambit of self regulation so the final point i would like to put as conclusion is that media it expands the media to follow up on issues relating to matters of public interest but through media trial the media is actually following only the matters that interest the public and not the matters that are of public interest so we would like to end our presentation here thank you right uh, thank you so much uh, vishalini and manoj uh, for your presentation um it's a good uh, you know comprehensive view point which you have laid about media trial and media ethics ethics undoubtedly has a key role uh, but as we as you rightly pointed out self regulation has its own limitation right um, so can you just throw more light on what kind of an overarching or superimposing regulation would work out in indian circumstances uh, you refer to the press council of india thing but uh, anything more specific or you would like to suggest uh mom here i feel like more than having the press council uh, ethical guidelines alone in hand we could have the we could amend it or we could like bring it into like kind of a legislation where now we have like new legislations coming up for digital media protection of personal data etc is going on so all these when we look into the internet and uh, media trial as a whole they all relate to right to privacy of individuals and then about justice centering system like right to fair trial etc so any a specific legislation because media trial is something that is now converging into not just the journalism or uh, broadcasting per se they are also into internet as well even how the internet data is are collected during investigation of media trial is also published in the media so i feel like this is a separate uh, kind of legislation which shouldn't be just focused upon the existing legislation alone but a new specific legislature could be brought under if manoj wants to add something to it he could go ahead yeah uh, thank you for the question ma'am uh, it it also actually struck me while doing research for this thing so we have the well established principle of functional equivalence functional equivalence in the sense no matter whether the media is the traditional sense or modern sense uh, uh, the same laws which apply which are applicable to the should applicable should be made applicable to the internet media also and that even led to the emergence of the it act we have it to so and since we know in last year september month uh, the supreme court had urged the uh, legislature to bring in appropriate guidelines within a stipulated time limit so of course the judiciary cannot step in, in step into that but, and of course there is a legal vacuum the judiciary cannot step into that since we have brought out the uh, telecommunications act of 2023 and as well as the personal digital personal digital uh, personal data protection act pdp act uh, 2023 so this uh, this broadcasting uh, and And the TV channels are brought outside the ambit of these situations. And if I mean, and even if we see the Telecom Act, OTT services are brought outside the ambit. And even if we take the IT rules, intermediary guidelines, twenty twenty one, minimal amount of regulations are only made with regard to the media. It's even remotely connected. So it is the solemn duty of the legislature to bring in an uh, appropriate legislation or the extrapolation of the extra legis uh, ex existing legislations so as to include the uh, media and TV channels within this bill. Okay. All right. Thank you for your response. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'd like to call upon the next presenter, Ayushi Bharti. Yes. Thank you. Am I audible? Yes. Hello, 
Is my screen visible? Yes, it is. Good afternoon to the esteemed pa uh, panel members. My current topic is the critical analysis on the current trends of gender-based cybercrime in India. I'm representing Alliance University. My research problem, the research problem is the gender-based cybercrimes are a complex challenge affecting the society. And it has a deep effect on the victims as well as this, uh, uh, the effect that it has on the cyberspace affecting the society and victims individually. Now, cybercrime is not merely a moral wrong, but it has various dimensions attached to it. Now, the rate of cybercrime has increased because of the social in inequalities among the genders and the loopholes in the legal framework. Be because of the frequency of the gender-based uh, cybercrime, it highlights the fundamental challenges such as the tackling gender disparity, uh, public attitudes, and legal structures. Now, there should be a developed approach to focus on education, legal reforms, technological advancement, and collaborative eff efforts of all. Now, the main the research objectives are to identify what are the various uh, forms of gender-based cybercrimes in India, and to analyze what is the legal framework addressing the gender-based cybercrimes current in India, and to identify the socio-economic factors influencing the cybercrime. The first research question which deals with the present legal framework regulating the cybercrime and is it effective enough to curb the cybercrime in, uh, in India? So the present legal, uh, the loopholes of the present legal framework as well as what are the current statutory laws for the same will be discussed here. And what are the socio-economic factors that influence the cybercrime? And how? what is the psychological impact on the minds of the cybercrime victims and how does it linger on them for a longer period of time? The research methodology been used here by the researcher is the primary and secondary uh, sources, that is articles, journals, and periodicals. And an empirical data has been collected from the different sources using stratified random sampling. Now, the challenges are in the legal framework. Now, section 65, uh, the 65, 66, and the various of the section of the IT acts deals with what are the computer related offenses, such as uh, section 66 deals with dishonestly if someone accesses the computer or punishment of sending offensive message, uh, messages through online uh, media or electronic modes. But uh, section 66B deals with what is it, uh, if someone dishonestly receives the stolen computer or any resources from the computer. 66E deals with the leaking someone's private information without the consent. 67 deals with if someone uh, publishes or transfer, transmits any lustful content in an electronic form. 67A deals with punishment or publishing of uh, material containing sexually explicit uh, content in electronic form. Now, Section 292 of IPC deals with the sale of obscene books, content, or public exhibition. But here, IPC nowhere defines what the word obscene means. In the case of uh, State of UP versus Thakur Prasad, the court uh, held that IPC does not define I, uh, obscene clearly. So IPC can be, uh, sorry, the obscene word can be understood as any offensive or mod any offensive act done to question the modesty or chastity of or any personating ideas of the person or to express the idea of the person or uh, in a lustful or unchastity ideas of the other person. Now the amendment in the IT Act which was done in 2008 did not include the word hacking. Hacking has been prevalent since the past two decades. Hacking was not been introduced in the IT Act. Now, hacking is one of the root cause of the cybercrime, cyber fraud. Hacker, you, uh, the hacker uses a stratified manner, that is the access of device without knowledge and consent of the other person to commit any cyber fraud, that, for example, money laundering or any other, uh, uh, taking, some, um, taking the amount from his bank account. Now, cyber pornography has increased in many folds. There are no stringent or particular laws dealing with uh, cyber pornography in particular. And there is no, it is difficult to establish jurisdiction because there are certain foreign websites, they have no access to the on online media in India. But what Indian cyber criminals do, that they post their content in, in a foreign websites. So it is very difficult to establish a jurisdiction over uh, such websites. And it is the enforceability of the punishment is not much stringent as it is for other offenses because the offenses covered under IT Act are mainly available. And if we looked at the sections discussed above, that is from 66 to 67A, 
all the sections merely have the punishment around three years, and this all are bailable offenses. There is no such uh, non bailable offenses are not included in the IT Act. So this gives the abusers or the cyber uh, criminals chance to abscond the legal proceedings or get any interim beliefs for the seat. Now moving on to the impact of socio-economic factors on cyber crime. Uh, India has been considered as a patriarchal society. Uh, in the morning session, the uh, Dr. Prashant Mali himself says that he himself said that uh, in the current scenarios, when in the family if there are iPhone users, what they do is they ask their wife and everyone to share the current find my uh, iPhone locations. So the male member is able to detect the location of uh, all the, all the other women members so it, this clearly shows the male dominance of the men in a household now the social engineering cycles all the cyber criminals or the abusers use a very uh, stratified and strategized manner to do any such act so there are four stages in this the first stage is they identify targets that is individuals employees but what they do is they in, in cases of cyber fraud, they identify an institution or uh, employees of the firms or a particular firm. In second stage, what they do is the depth research. They identify the, how will they collect their personal data and any other data related to the particular firm. In the third stage, they try to develop the familiarity with the, if it's a firm, they try to develop a familiarity with the person having information of the system or the IT department. And the fourth and the final stage is they using all the informations and data that they have collected, they will use it in a in cyberspace to commit the cyber crime. Now, use of social media has been increased in a tremendous rate. At the beginning of 2023 in India, according to the Forbes Advisors report, there are 398 social media users in India. But according to Dr. Seiji in the morning sessions, he said that there are 300 people in India who are not even connected to the internet or social media. So there is almost 50-50 gap. 50% are using the internet and 50% those who are not using it and they are mainly women and uh, the marginalized people. So now social media has, in, with the increase in social media, it has directly, the proportion of the cyber crime has been seen directly proportional. Now multiple IDs or fake IDs have been created by a single user. Now revenge. Envy is considered as the most natural human tendency. But when this envy is converted into jealousy, and this jealousy when converted into revenge is, becomes extremely dangerous. And because of the anonymity of, because there is no identification, user identification required in social media. So they take revenge in such a manner that it's very difficult to track down who, who was the person who has committed the cyber crime. Now, impact of movies and web series on, an individual. The impact of movies and web series has a um, deep effect on the subconscious mind of people because the scenes lingers on the mind of people for a longer period of time. Now, if there are illicit or objectionable content being seen, it, it has a negative impact on the minds of the children because there is no age authentication required in some websites still. Now, men are often portrayed as powerful characters in, in, in Bollywood movies. Now, how it influences how people pursue or see the gender roles in real life. Now, what is the impact of the cyber crime on the mental health of the victims? The persons or any people who have suffered the are the victim of the cyber crime, they have they start questioning their uh, identity, they start questioning about their safety. This leads to increased fear and anxiety. And cyber crime is very difficult to track sometimes because. People change their IP address very quickly. So it is very difficult to uh, track the uh, evidences here. And the social media is a common site of cyber abuse. Now, marginalized women or transgender have never been fully protected because they have been trolled or either they have been uh, sent some illicit messages or content. Now, the inc this increases the risk of privacy, privacy invasion compared to men. Now, the psychological fear has been increased because of some cyber crimes has resulted into brutal rape, rape cases too. Now, technology has been two-sided coin. That is, the advantage is it has connected people all over the world and it has made our lives very easier. But at the same side, it is said that during pandemic, the increase, there was 
100% of an increased cyber crime in India. Now, this has led to PTSD, which is post-traumatic disorder, which means the person might go to depression, anxiety, or any suicidal thoughts. This which leads to self-doubt or any, uh, any other adverse mental disorder. Now, victims find it that they lose their identity because of uh, cybercrime. The researcher has tried to collect the, the data through random stratified sampling. Now, here the data was collected uh, in a random sources. So, the, mainly the respondents or the participants were female. And the main, uh, sorry, the main uh, age range that they fall into is between 20 to 30. And they believe that the majority of the cyber crimes are reported in the northern part of India. So it, uh, the question was, did you report the crime to an appropriate authority? Majority of them said no, they were they have not been aware. The further question also is whether they were aware of the same or not. I, almost 45% of the people are not even aware about reporting it to, sorry, 27% of people are not even aware about reporting to such an authority. And almost every website we use, the first uh, pop-up that we get, did you, did you accept all the cookies? And they believe that this accepting all the cookies uh, exposes their uh, personal information to a wider uh, people or a wider net network. The next question was, the, uh, which people are more vulnerable to uh, cybercrime? And the answer, uh, they got us between the age of 20 to 30. And... Uh, it is almost in 50-50 ratio that almost women and uh, children of tender age are equally affected by the cyber crime. Uh, are, according to you, the, are the cases reported to the cyber crime to an appropriate authority? Majority of, of them believe that the cyber crime are not being reported to the appropriate authority. Now, in the next question was uh, whether they are aware about what are the procedures or where to go and how to file a cybercrime uh, report. They 46% of them said that they are partially aware. There is so lack of awareness that they are not even aware that if they could file a complaint Rajiv, or that. Yes. I'm sorry for interrupting, but the time is up. So, can you just conclude in two minutes? Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. And and they said the majority of them that there should be stricter implementation of rules and there should be regular or seminar and workshops organized by the uh, government in collaboration with the NGOs. And when it comes to what impact does the cyber crime leaves on an individual minor, what is the intensity or the depth of the cyber crime? They they rated it between seven to nine. Now I would like to move forward to the conclusion. The current trends are deep. Current trends in the cybercrime show the deeply in, uh, rooted inequality among each gender. Now, this increases in the rate of cybercrime indicates that we need a robust legal framework and a holistic approach by the government to curb cybercrime in consultation with the technological institutions. Majority of the cybercrimes go unreported as we have seen in the survey because of the lack of awareness and reporting it to the appropriate authority or they, either they are not aware of the procedure or the victim is in trauma because of this crime. Appropriate authority shall make more awareness by creating regular workshops, seminars, and uh, debates. Now, the relationship between mental health and online uh, safety must be acknowledged to curb the gender-based cybercrime. Now, women are often the marginalized community and the sense of inadequacy, and they have always felt the sense of inadequacy compared to men in uh, relation with the technology. Now, the participation of women is relatively less in creating policy. If they, uh, to increase the cyber security, if there is increased participation of women, uh, the gender neutral laws and technologies would be developed. Secondly, if there are regular seminar, workshops or programs to inform the public about basics of cyber crime and the solution related, basically digital literacy of women and other ch children of tender age. Penalize offenders, cybersecurity professionals shall be deployed uh, in the relevant sectors. And the present member should be trained using uh, technologies and tracking down the criminals. And th fourthly, the last is the stricter implementation laws. And if there is a specialized, the appropriate authority can also 
suggest a tribunal for uh, appoint a specified tribunal for the same and give the quasi judicial power to dis uh, dispose of such matters. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ayushi, for your presentation. Um, I have uh, two quick questions. Uh, you have used stratified random sampling. Yes, uh, ma'am. So I believe your sample size is from India, right? The sample? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma okay. Yes. And your analysis, what you have portrayed, is also quite specific to Indian scenario. Yes, ma'am. Okay, all right. Uh, my then my first question is: um, Can you give uh, come up with some examples of from other jurisdictions which could be incorporated uh, in the Indian scenario, vis-a-vis -vis the factors you have discussed, say for instance, mental health and other ramifications. And my second question is: um, When you see the development of technology, particularly say for instance AI, right? Do you think presently Indian cybercrime laws or laws related to cybercrime in India are adept to, you know, tackle the impact of that technology. I hope I was audible. Ma'am, you were not audible. Oh, I'm so sorry. So I think my first question is clear about the stratified random sampling. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so my question is, if your analysis is uh, so specific to India, uh, can you uh, point out to certain examples or instances from other jurisdictions vis-a-vis -vis the ramifications you have discussed, say, for instance, mental health and other, where which could be incorporated in India? And my second question is uh, about the advanced technologies like AI. Do you think the existing laws in India... So AI also in a way contributes to cybercrime. You know, the nature of cybercrime is changing because of AI. So do you think the existing laws um, in India are capable to cater to it? Uh, to answer your first question, ma'am, uh, for the stratified random sampling, uh, the researcher has tried to, in a strategized manner, identify the questions and uh, identifying the target audience and then have put the questions for the same. For the second answer, uh, that is for any other jurisdictions for the jurisdiction question uh, for example when we see uh, look into the us us has uh, we comparatively when we look into the sections of uh, from it section 66 to a b c d e and to section 67 now all this uh, sections have minimum around punishment uh, the imprisonment is around 3 to 5 years but when we move to us for the any such hacking or any other cyber uh, crime committed by an or individual, the punishment, uh, the punishment is up to ten years or twenty years. There is a stringent laws in US, and and there are um one that is federal. I am forgetting the name. That is Federal Trade Commission Act is there for identifying the or giving the punishment under the for the cyber criminals. Now can you? Kindly repeat okay. the thought. No, no worries, no worries. But that's that's sufficient. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. We can have the next speaker. Uh, I'd like to call upon J.K. Jake Khan. Yes. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon. Yeah, I'd like to present my screen now. Yeah. So firstly, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Jackie Khan. I'm a research scholar at University School of Law and Research from University of Science and Technology, Meghalaya. And today I'll be presenting my paper on unraveling the impact of AI on gender-based violence, safeguarding data privacy and legal frameworks for a safer tomorrow. So first of all, I would like to state, uh, I would like to introduce my paper by stating that AI is a transformative force with the potential to reshape various facets of human society. No doubt it has great potential nowadays and as such it has been widely accepted by our society in each and every sector in each and every phases of the governance or even we can say health even in education ai has been largely been embedded in our society so intelligence is different from autonomy because intelligence uh, in because of intelligence because intelligence is the potential to 
learn, it can plan, and moreover, it can apply decision on its own without any intervention. As such, it has the potential to provide access to information and services. It has the potential to enhance safety and security, support survivors and activists, and promote gender equality and empowerment. Now, gender-based violence is new in our society, but it has manifest uh, reaches across its homes, workplaces, communities, and online platforms. Now, AI can be a powerful tool for monitoring, detecting, as well as reporting GBP incidents, generating evidence to inform policies. However, AI can also be harmful or it has its negative effect. It can perpetuate harmful gender stereotypes, facilitate new forms of violence, such as deep fakes or cyber stalking, and enable trafficking and exploitation of women and girls. So AI's unintended consequences can undermine privacy, autonomy, as well as dignity, thereby facilitating a fertile ground for new forms of GBP. So my point here is that AI, by the advent of AI, a new form or a, a new fertile ground for uh, commission of GBB has been emanated. So these are the actually forms and manifestations of AI-enabled GBB. First is online harassment, uh, which refers to digital platforms, tools to intimidate, threaten, or humiliate women. This has been somehow uh, to a certain extent with regard to cyber crime. It has been already addressed by the with by the Information Technology Act 2000. Then we have deep fakes. My previous uh, participants have already delved upon this concept, but I would like to add here that only three seconds of video is sufficient enough to create a perfect deep fake or manipulate a video to create a perfect deep fake. It can be used for gen uh, gender-based violence. It can be used for politically motivated violence. It can has various ramifications. Thereafter, we have cyber stalking, which is also a form of voyeurism, and it has also been addressed by the IT Act 2000, but only to the extent of information technology, not to the extent of AI. Thereafter, we have algorithmic uh, discriminations, which denotes unjust and biased treatments of individuals or groups. So recently, we have the Amazon case where the AI who was expect accepting or going through scrutinizing the um, applications have seamlessly rejected just because uh, they are girls or women's or they have mentioned the term that they have studied in a women university. Thereafter, we have sextortion. Each and every day we go through such news that uh, exploitation of digital platforms for black blackmailing as well as to extort individuals are being carried on. We have image-based abuse, which involves unauthorized sharing or distribution of intimate or sexual photos or videos of individuals without their consent. Thereafter, new form of violence, we have uh, doxing, which encompasses the malicious publications or disclosure of individuals' private or personal informations. We also have online gender as well as sexual harassment, which entails subjecting individuals to unwanted or unwelcome sexual advances, requests, comments through digital platforms. Now, I have in my research paper, I have gone through the national as well as international frameworks for GBV. I have gone through, I have already uh, gone through all through the uh, international uh, events or international, you can say the frameworks of which India is a signatory. I have also gone through all the uh, already available legislations of which India has enforced for controlling GBV. And after going through this, I have found these uh, loopholes or you can say challenges for implementation of the laws in controlling GBV. So first is the lack of adequate resources, infrastructures, and capacities of the relevant institutions and agencies. Thereafter, we have lack of awareness, knowledge, which previous presenters have already presented. Thereafter, we have uh, the lack of coordination as well as collaboration and accountability among different stakeholders and sectors, which uh, provides for lack of monitoring, evaluation, as well as reporting mechanisms to assess the impact and effectiveness of the laws and justice policies. Thereafter, we have lack of Although there are uh, pre many research already done, then also we have uh, still there are certain gaps as well as challenges for the purpose of best practices and in the implementation and enforcement of the legal frameworks. Thereafter, we have <clears throat> the lack of harmonization and consistency of the legal frameworks across different levels and jurisdictions, such as nationals and subnationals and local laws. And India is a diverse country, as so we have customary religious as well as traditional laws, which often creates conflicts and loopholes or gaps in protection and prosecution of GBB cases. Thereafter, there is a lack of gender sensitivity. No doubt there are a plethora of laws, but uh, these are not gender sensitive sometimes or which fails to address the specific needs and experience of the perspective of from the perspective of women and girls. Thereafter, there is a lack of participation and consultation of the civil society. 
especially women's rights organizations and movements in the design, implementation, and evaluation of these legal frameworks. Thereafter, there is a lack of alignment and integration of legal frameworks and other relevant frameworks and standards such as the international and regional human, human rights instruments, the SDGs, and the national development plans and strategies. So with regard to privacy, until August 2023, India did not have any legislations, but after August 2023, India has enacted the Digital Data Personal uh, uh, Act, but these uh, DPDP Act also comes with certain advantages as well as limitation and challenges. No doubt the Constituent Assembly, while enacting the Constitution, not even once they have mentioned the term privacy in their constitutional debates, but only after four years of enacting the Constitution, four years after only Supreme Court has faced with privacy related challenges of which for which our we can thank our uh, dynamic judiciary which has developed the jurisprudence regarding privacy and which has ultimately led to the Swami's case where it was declared as a fundamental right and today we have the digital personal data protection act so dpdp act firstly it establishes a certain framework and remedies for victims and survivors whose personal data is manipulated or exploited it defines certain uh, sensitive personal data and encompasses certain categories of uh, sexual orientation, sex life, and biometric and genetic data. The Act also acknowledges the vulnerabilities of inherent AI and GB, uh, GBB scenarios. It has certain provisions, no doubt, regarding consent, notice, and transparency requirement for data processing as well as data subjects. But it has uh, many limitations and challenges. First of all is the lack of explicit recognition, lack of explicit recognition with regard to the new form of violence with regard to AI. Thereafter, sharing of data regarding cross-border implications are not being adequately uh, are not being adequately uh, issued. Thereafter, we have inadequate regulations with regard to AI technologies. There are limited protection and empowerment regarding GBV. Thereafter, there is an insufficient addressal of consent and agency inadequate accountability as well as liability. There is a lack of redressal as well as compensation. There is a limited civil society participation as well. Now, I have done a case study in this regard and analysis of AI's impact on GBV. Sorry. No, we are not able to hear you. The last case. Am I audible, ma'am? Uh, yes, now you are. Yeah. So it was not only Rashmika Mandana, first of all, it was Kajol, then we have Katrina Kaif, and now recently we have a victim is the Alia Bhatt, where they are being targeted through deep fake videos. So it was Rashmika Mandana's case, but the issue was publicized, compelling everyone to notice that the issues are grave and serious. Actually, these are influential women, and because of these influential women, the gravity or the seriousness of these uh, deep fakes or these type of violence has come to the forefront. People are talking about it now. So this video clip was being largely circulated. Thereafter, cases were filed and arrests have been made. But the ramifications are very limited, and it is limited because nowadays uh, the technology is readily available regarding deep fakes. And then after we uh, the uh, a simple mobile phone, we do not need uh, quantum computers while running this AI enabled or AI applications. Only a mobile phone is enough, simple technology is enough to run this. So these things uh, make it more stringent. So it serves as a stark reminder of urgent need for stringent measures to address the proliferation of AI enabled GBB. So from this, we can learn these things that nowadays, these things are an issue with regard to AI, AI enabled GBV. So AI has the potential to violate human rights and dignity of victims and survivors. AI can infringe their right to participate and benefit from the digital society and economy. AI can harm mental health and well-being of the victims or survivors. AI also has the effect, their self-esteem, confidence and identity and can lead to social stigma, isolation and suicide even. AI can damage the personal and professional life of victims and survivors. AI can expose them to further abuse, harassment, or violence, both online and offline, because trolling is nowadays is a norm nowadays. Thereafter, AI can undermine the credibility and trust digital media and information, such as spreading misinformation, disinformation, as well as propaganda. AI can also impact the quality and reliability of various domains and sectors. 
So in order to combat AI's evil effect on GBV, I have uh, recommended in my research paper these five recommendations. Firstly is to enact a comprehensive legislation for AI regulation. It is time now. Uh, uh, many uh, people will argue that uh, research, it is it, the research and development is in its very initial stage and full potential of AI has not yet been realized, but uh, a regulation will provide for a disciplined research and development as such uh, in a Hello. of a robust legislation framework Hello. is Sorry now for interrupting. that uh, now me. it is it is time to enact a one. Uh, sorry. Yeah, I, can I continue? Yeah, yeah, you can just conclude because the time is up. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I yes, agree. yes, yes, ma'am. This is my last slide. Uh, uh, secondly, uh, we need to amend our existing laws to address AI-enabled GBB. We need to strengthen the institutional mechanisms because most of the, you can say, the enforcement agencies, even the judiciaries, are not well versed with AI technologies as such. And this is in the need of the hour. Uh, thereafter, we have to enhance our data collection analysis in order to better understand the prevalence patterns as well as impacts. And lastly, we need to raise uh, public awareness as well as education. And by educating, we can the relevant stakeholders about the nature, risk, and legal framework related to AI enabled GBB. We can curb these issues. So this is my last slide. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Right. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, insightful presentation. Uh, I have two questions. You have used the term unintended consequences of AI. Yes, uh, so uh, please throw some light on it. Where does it stem from and what actually you're pointing out to? Secondly, uh, you have mentioned about harmonization of laws. Um, I appreciate that you have pointed out to the diversity within our own country itself, right? And uh, how laws should cater to that diversity. And towards the end, you have mentioned that there should be a comprehensive legal regulation related to AI. India, particularly at this moment, at least, is not keen to bring an AI-specific regulation. And then you say that you know the existing laws uh, should be amended uh, to address this GBV issue. Uh, so how practical you feel this um, harmonization is? Do you think practically it is feasible? And, and what is your stand? Uh, should there should be a specific AI regulation that that will solve all the issues, or uh, just uh, as you have suggested in your another point that you can, you know, ex amend the existing laws? So what would you finally narrow down to? Mm, regarding your second question, ma'am, uh, the re the recent uh, all the regulations that we have, like the protection of women from domestic violence or the Information Technology Act, or any other law for curbing GBB, which has already been enacted, those are not, uh, means they do not address uh, AI-related issues. So that is my point regarding your first question, ma'am, the unintended consequences of AI, even the makers of AI, because Snapchat was for fun, the uh, making of uh, videos, funny videos, that was for fun, but uh, now it has crept up into something which can be used for violence, which can be used for uh, manipulation. So that was my, that is my answer. Okay, thank Those you. Thank you, yeah. thank you. I'd like to call upon the next presenters, Kumari Kanishka. Hi, Good afternoon, ma'am. I, along with my two co-authors, will be presenting today. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I and my co-authors are here to present. I am Shubhra Goel, and I, along with my... Uh, co-authors, Ms. Kumari Kanishka and Ms. Ramjim Gupta, we are here to present a paper on the topic, Privacy of Data, the Highly Advertised Fool's Paradise. We are third-year law students at Symbiosis Law School, Noida. Just a minute, man, there is some technical issue.
uh, sorry ma'am for the delay is the screen visible now uh, yes it is sorry sorry very much uh, the research objectives are mainly to examine legal frameworks and their effectiveness in protecting individual privacy in the digital age to analyze real life examples of data breaches and privacy violations across various industries to assess the role of government and regulatory bodies in supervising data protection measures starting with the introduction in recent years the explosion of digital information has thrust privacy and data protection into the spotlight like never before we are constantly sharing personal information um details online often without fully grasping the consequences despite assurances of security breaches and misuse of data continue to plague us even with laws in place they seem toothless in the face of these challenges think about it every time you sign offer a new we sign for a, a new app make a purchase online or even just browse the web we are giving away bits and pieces of our information and while we are told that our data is safe in the hands of companies and institution the reality often tells a different story just look at the headlines data breaches privacy scandals and the misuse of personal information seems to be uh, a dozen sure lawmakers are trying to keep up they have passed legislation and which aimed at, which aims at protecting our privacy rights but it is clear that these laws are not cutting it they are like a leaky dam trying to hold back a flood of digital information we need a more than just surface level protections we need a more comprehensive reforms that address the root cause of this issue in today's digital age the concept of data privacy once considered a fundamental right seems to be slipping through our fingers we have witnessed numerous high profile data breaches and security lapses that have shattered the illusion of our personal information being safe online take for example the case of sina vibo one of the china's largest social media platforms in june 2020 over 538 million user accounts were compromised exposing sensitive details like real names user names and even phone numbers on the dark web this breach despite rigorous monitoring highlighted the vulner vulnerability of even major platform and it is not just social media giants facing these challenges in june 2023 the automotive uh, the automotive uh, company toyota experienced a breach that exposed around 260000 customer records due to misconfigured cloud environment while the breach didn't uh, compromise highly sensitive data uh, data it underscored the risk posed by simple misconfiguration these incidents are not isolated linkedin is another such prominent platform which fell victim to a data scrapping breach in 2023 impacting approximately 700 million profiles data management and reliance on third party providers data collection and storage also faces ethical concerns which revolve around national security personal liberty and privacy the major shareholder of this data is a third party that government has no access to further the one click based interfaces have made citizens victims of ignorance haste thereby digital insecurity lack of digital literacy fueling threats to privacy the capacity to proficiently navigate and employ technological and digital information in diverse circumstances is known as a digital literacy the elderly children rural population and economically backward population is the most prone to digital illiteracy among the masses trivial data pieces that let browsers application track and store information about a user session like cookies continue reading i agree result in breach of privacy due to unawareness hence even those who consider themselves to be sufficiently equipped to deal with technological jargon may fail to effectively protect their own data the abyss of unregulated dark web cyber criminals use this curtain of anonymity to carry out a variety of nefarious operations such as purchasing and reselling stolen information obtained through data breaches on dark web cyber criminals use medical records 
social security numbers, addresses, financial information such as bank account, credit card numbers, passwords, and other login credentials such as username and password, using them for targeted assaults, identity theft, and criminal acts. Society and the state are unable to adequately address the problems posed by this reem if there is a lack of sufficient legislation and accountability, and women are one of the most sought victims in this arena of dark web. Over to Kanishka. Artificial intelligence has been introduced to the public, and it surpasses every limit of privacy. The concept of consent has diminished due to deep fakes, resulting not only in breaches of privacy, but also in loss of reputation, harassment, and mental trauma. Another result of AI is that it has erased the authenticity of information. Explicit graphic content has been used with the intention of taking revenge, humiliating, embarrassing people. It can lead to social ostracization, mental trauma, loss of jobs and relation, among a lot of other problems. The problem here lies in the unregulated use of technology like AI, as it is relatively new introduction in the public space. While AI and dark web have not been properly looked into yet, legislative and judicial efforts have been made in general. Next slide, please. The legislative efforts We're that have been but made... Your time is up, so can you just make your concluding statements? Yes. The legislative efforts that have been made so far point us in the direction that is right. However, their implementation has not benefited us a lot because from these data leaks, it is evident that there is something that we're not able to do correctly. In the light of this discussion, the first step to tackling privacy risk is to acknowledge that privacy as it stands today due to continuous and fast paced technological developments is not fully protected. There is spontaneous deregulation in the space, which refers to the fact that technology is growing at a pace with which uh, legislation is not able to follow. So to ensure that legislations uh, that are mostly used these days, GDPR, APEC regulations, or even the DPDP Act of 2023, which is to be implemented in India right now, they have to be literally interpreted. And broad terminologies like public order, national security, legitimate use, cannot always be used to stretch the idea of evading privacy. Independent regulatory bodies should be increased in this area so that uh, the perpetrators can be investigated regardless of their stature. Digital privacy literacy should also be our focus. With this, we'd like to conclude our discussion. Right. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation, Kanishka, Rimjim, and Shubhra. Uh, I just have one question. You raised an interesting point about digital literacy. Uh, so what do you think um, are the steps which can be taken to increase digital literacy? Now, are there any specific provisions in existing laws to increase it? There aren't any specific provisions as of now in India, ma'am. But if we see on a broader level, uh, digital literacy should now be considered as a part of right to education itself. Okay. It should be included in the school curriculum itself so that children whose life's parts have become technology <coughs> these days, even from a very young age, they are handed over technology. So in those cases, it is important that this should be a part of our curriculum so that from a very young age, you understand the implications of the kind of technology you're dealing with. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. All right. So I'd like to call upon the next presenter, Kathira. Good afternoon, ma'am. I'm audible. Yes, you are. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. One minute, ma'am. I will share the screen. Is the screen visible, ma'am? Mm, yes, now it is. Yeah, thank you. I think you can start. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. 
good afternoon everyone i am here to present uh, my paper on uh, the cross sir yeah one minute yeah i am here to present my paper titled as in the cross is a legal analysis of gender dimension in sexual crimes i am a secondary bcom llb student uh, from tamil nadu national university uh, nowadays we have uh, we have a lot of uh, cyber crimes uh, happening in our society but what we ignore is uh, in intersectional uh, what we ignore is there's a call, uh, always uh, a major uh, major major set of gender affects in this cyber crime that is women uh, this paper tries to uh, look upon the intersectionality of, of cyber crimes and uh, uh, the concept of gender when a crime is focused based on gender that that type of cyber crime is known as gender based violence uh we nowadays uh, gender based violence uh, in cyber in most of the cyber crimes are directly or indirectly affecting uh, affecting women only uh, in well unlike in the national crime record national crime records bureau report it revealed that in 2022 there were 4 lakh 45000 cases of crimes against women indicating a 4% increase compared to previous year additionally the report highlighted a 24.4% surge in registered cyber crimes uh, this this data shows about the uh, increasing trend of violence against violence against women now we In case you are moving the slides, uh, I am only able to see the first slide. Yeah, ma'am, uh, I am moving. Hey, can you see, ma'am? Yeah. Uh, I am here. Moving to the next chapter. Uh, legal perspective on gender sexual crime. Uh, I am here to first discuss about cyber pornography. The in the case of Texas Union of India. the case the judgment starts with the internet never sleep and the internet never forgets it it tries to uh, imply that once uh, content is shared in, shared on the internet it perpetually exists and it uh, it 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 was reshared continuously which is a highly dangerous thing for uh, non consensual uh, sexual videos uh, talking about current Uh, statistics about cyber pornography nearly uh, the pornography industry is valued at nearly around 1.1 billion dollars uh, united united states alone and globally it was valued around uh, 172 billion dollars uh, billion us dollars when we look upon the pornography nearly 97 of 97% of the pornography contains women as a target group of aggression and men were the aggressors of uh, aggressors in the 76% of scene this pornography is just imparting the patriarchal patriarchal structure of the society which is exist in the before in the real world uh, and it ja- directly imparts it in, into the offline world or not in, in the cy- cyber space also uh, we look up on the law uh, the major law that uh, handles the pornography is information technology act section 67 67 of the it act deals with transmission or uh, tra- transmitting or publishing of obscene uh, obscene, uh, obscene materials when we look up on the section 292 of the ipc we can uh, know about the definition of obscene uh, not the uh, uh, not it is doesn't define obscenity but it defined the obscene act uh, the obscene act should be lascivious or appeals to the prurient interest or its effects such as to deprive and corrupt persons to read see or hear the matter contained or embedded in it uh, the 67a punishes uh, for transmitting or publishing uh, any kind of uh, uh, any kind of obscene material and 67b punishes for child, child uh, creating seeking browsing or downloading a child pornography uh, and also for transmitting or publishing it, uh, it punishes uh, such crimes also the indecent uh, representation of women act uh, 
section 3 of section 3 prohibits one to publish or cause to be published or arrange to take part in the publication or exhibition of advertisements that's rep uh, which represents women in a indecent form uh, the subset of uh, pornography is non consensual pornography which is a major threat uh, prevailing in our society non consensual pornography is a pornography which is shared without the consent of the uh, the without the consent of the victim particularly when we look at up, look upon uh, image based image based violence uh, image based violence is commonly known as revenge pornography but pornography is a word that means uh, it requires consent but when we so it's not appropriate to use revenge pornography instead image based sexual violence uh, sexual abuse is a better word to use uh, better better term to coin coin this type of crime uh, in this type of uh, crime the intimate images of uh, the victim is shared without the consent for either blackmailing extorting or any other to take the revenge then uh, this uh, this type of uh, crime also involves cyber doxing cyber doxing means uh, attaching the details of the contact number user ids uh, user ids of social media etc uh, with the video so that uh, they will so the because of that they will be cyber bullied by the society as well as the uh, in the online due to the uh, availability of such uh, personal identifiable information this kind of the image based sexual abuse can be uh, punished under uh, section 66e of infamous act which prohibits uh, uh, which pro which punishes for violation of privacy uh, um, it, it is applicable in the cases where the video or uh, media or video or image was shared without the consent of the victim in the case of animo animesh animo animesh bosi versus state of uh, state of west bengal versus animesh bosi uh, it uh, the court punished uh, the accused for sharing of non consensual images of girlfriend girlfriend in his website uh, in the website uh, under sections of 66e 67 and 67a uh, of information technology act and also it uh, included section 44 of ipc uh, which which talks about injury uh, the court inferred that because of sharing the sharing such images to an online she she was injured by injured to the reputation and privacy uh, of the uh, reputation and privacy of her so it, are, it also included section 44 of the indian penal code uh, the next subset of cyber pornography is deep fake we know it's a lot lot more discussed Uh, issue in this uh, currently uh, oh, we are not able to hear you yeah are you audible am i audible yeah okay thank you uh deepak refers to the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques particularly deep learning to create realistic looking fake videos or audio recordings uh, nowadays uh this this kind of pre the prevalence of deep fakes is uh, has increased very much when we take upon the data of 2018 it was the prevalence of deep fakes approximately is around uh, 8000 only but now in 2023 the prevalence of deep fake videos on the internet is 1 lakh nearly 1 lakh 44000 videos which uh, show that the increase of deep fakes uh, available on easily available on the internet Uh, around 99 percentage of deep fakes are targeting women only. Uh, this this kind of a deep fakes seriously undermine the uh, privacy of the woman and reputation of the woman also. Uh, the victimized woman or the victimized woman often found they are constantly bullied or harassed by the society as well as in online, and it morally degrades the woman by merely objectifying the person. defects uh are defects softwares are easily available in uh, uh platforms like github anyone can download and distribute videos 
without any uh, unique idea, without their without they are being punished by the authorities uh, this kind of uh, the deep fakes can be punished under the 66 information technology act under section 66e 67 67a of it act 2000 and then uh, we can also invoke 66b of the it act which punishes one for engaging in cheating through personalization using communication devices or computer resources additionally Uh, okay, your time is up. If you can just yeah. don't take us to the conclusion. Yeah, I'll I'll just conclude. Yeah. Yeah, I and also yeah, just move your slides. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my uh, my suggestions are making intermediate liable. So in an online world, uh, detecting the detecting the uh, wrongdoer is uh, actually hard, and the victims are not. Uh, getting any compensations or uh, any kind of remedies uh, in most of the cases so making an intermediary liable will be helpful uh, uh, for the victim to proceed legal action and then regulation of the deep fake the to regulate deep fake we do not have any specific law regulating deep fake unlike other countries uh, recently new york also launched the law for regulating deep fakes particularly uh, the china is uh, the china is regulating the deep fakes by cyber space administration administration, uh, uh, administration uh, act uh, and also eu also proposed the ai act which overall regulating the ai a yeah i think and then i also propose to develop the also propose to develop the uh, also strengthen the police force recently kerala uh, kerala kerala police uh, are trained by the uh, national technical research organization data security council of india national forensic uh, science university uh, are trained by this uh, this kind of organizations which help them uh, to procure new talent and new talent uh, and then i also propose to uh, include more uh, legal knowledge uh, in the textbooks of uh, in the school textbook and then i finally conclude by uh, finally conclude by saying that uh, the awareness of law uh, among people the well trained police squads and the police squads and newer and uh, newer laws will strengthen the regime of a uh, regime of a country uh, thank okay you. thank you thank you so much kathiravan uh, just a uh, couple of questions what exactly is your research objective um, my research objective is uh, to analyze about laws and uh, addressing the addressing the solutions for the uh, addressing the solutions for uh, that there are legal vacuums and uh, other problems okay uh, you mentioned about uh, intermediary liabilities uh, don't you think the existing uh, provisions are sufficient to tackle uh, the existing provision in it act uh, section 79 excludes them uh, certain liabilities like hosting by the third party in in our case if a deep fake video was hosted by a host, uh, hosted in a social media the hosted person is th third party and the intermediaries are easily uh, escaping from this liability but uh, to get a proper justice to victim if a intermediaries intermediary become liable for the acts they will be uh, it, it will help victim also okay okay all right thank you so much kathiravan for your presentation Shubhanshi. Now, okay. nice. All right. I'd like, I'd like to call upon the next presenter, Shubhanshi Fogel. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
काठी राहून कॅन यू स्टॉप कॅन यू जस्ट ओके ना यू कॅन प्रेझेंट युअर स्क्रीन प्लेस Greetings of the day to everyone. Today I, Shubhanshi Fagat, along with my co-presenter, Rudra Ditya, are here to take you all through our paper titled The Age of AI Renaissance, Taming the Strands of Privacy in Data Deluge. The advent of AI marks a pivotal chapter in the age of technological evolution, heralding an era that could well be termed as the AI Renaissance. This period is characterized by the rapid development and integration of AI across various sectors, be it education, finance, medicine, security, and entertainment, ushering in an unprecedented economic and social benefits. However, as we navigate through the deluge of data and innovation, the dual-edged sword of AI becomes increasingly apparent, particularly in its impact on privacy, data protection, and gender equity. Our paper actually attempts to address the data concerns and breaches through a combination of legal compliance and regulations uh, and uh, robust encryption mechanisms or uh, comprehensive trainings uh, for generative AI tools uh, and most importantly, implementation of ethical AI practices. So in a sense, we positioned ourselves as the stewards of this new renaissance, charged with the responsibility of integrating technological advancement uh, and privacy consideration. Our goal is to foster a harmonious balance between innovation and rights. Moving on, we have the research objectives over here. First being examining the impact of AI on privacy and data protection, wherein we have delved into the specific ways AI applications, such as personalized recommendation system, automated decision-making processes, collect, process, and utilize personal data assessing. the risks and challenges posed to privacy at each stage uh, please Second, so we have sorry to interrupt you i am not able to see your screen it's just blank uh, uh can you just give now. me a minute i'm just uh, figuring no, it out it is visible now yeah now uh, it is i just need to uh and it just i just need two tabs at one place just wait a second please sorry yeah now is it visible yeah yeah, yeah okay. yes sorry sorry for that yeah uh moving on the second uh, research objective being identifying gender biases in ai algorithms their manifestations in ai applications and their implications on individual rights and thereby proposing a multifaceted strategy for mitigating these biases to ensure fairness and equity in ai outcomes we are going to move on to the third objective which is evaluating the effectiveness of existing data protection regulations in the context of ai so this will assess the current landscape of data protection laws especially uh, gdpr dpdp and also the recently enacted eu ai act with a particular focus on the effectiveness of the govern of them governing the ai technologies 
Uh, just change I'm, the flight. Uh, it's still yeah, the same. I'm on the objective part, right? Okay, okay. Yeah. So moving on to the fourth objective, which is we we have proposed a holistic interdisciplinary strategy for AI security and privacy. So the purpose of this objective was a balanced approach that leverages the benefits of AI while safeguarding individual privacy, privacy rights and data protection. So this research explores interdisciplinary strategies and encompass technical, regulatory and ethical and social dimensions advocating for a paradigm shift. The journey of AI from its conceptual inception to its current state of ubiquity is nothing short of being remarkable. Be it AlphaGo's victory over human champions or ChatGPT's force capability, underscoring AI's potential to revolutionize industries, redefine the human computer interactions and raise important questions about AI ethics and has actually set a new benchmark for AI's role in society. Yet this journey has been punctuated by significant setbacks reflecting the complex interplay between technological advancement and societal readiness. The diagram on your screen shows the stages of AI life cycle with the possible privacy breaches at each stage, highlighting the urgent need for enhanced privacy protections and ethical AI practices. It actually shows that how AI systems necessitates data collection and analysis of vast amount of data which heightens the risk of data breaches, thus justifying the incidences that we hear about security breaches by MNCs or increasing lawsuits in US addressing ethical and legal implications or even the recent ban of chat GPT in Italy. This illustrates that the growing global concern over AI's potential misuse and the critical need for the stringent data protection measures to safeguard against such breaches. Proceeding ahead, we have another critical issue that the paper addresses is the intersection of technology and society. That is the gender biases in AI algorithms and the pressing need for transparency and ethical practices, ensuring that our advancement in AI foster equity. On your screens are two major causes of gender biases in AI, first being the training data. So the training data either underrepresents or misrepresents genders or encodes unconscious biases of human hands that create them. And as a result, AI systems perpetuate these inaccuracies. And this was the case with Amazon, wherein the gender disparity was found in the machine learning based hiring tool favoring male applicants over female applicants. The second source being uh, the black box nature of AI systems, wherein the opacity and the unexplainability due to data intensive processes, hinders the ability to ensure fairness and also erodes public trust in AI technologies. This was the case that happened with Twitter. The paper believes that the mitigation of gender biases in AI requires a multifaceted strategy, which should actually address the diverse and inclusive training data, should enhance algorithmic transparency, should include legal and ethical compliances and inclusion of broad spectrum of stakeholders ensuring gender equitable AI systems. Discussing about AI and possible privacy breaches, I would like Rudra to now elaborate on the evolving legal landscape. Uh, and I would like to move on to my uh, to the legislative part of data protection. So we are going to discuss the benchmark frameworks or the golden level of data protection legislations of the world. Why studying this is crucial is because uh, Laws like GDPR have set foundation and principles for legislations in developing countries. For example, the DPDP of 2023 in our country is partially based on GDPR. So the General Data Protection Regulation is a comprehensive data protection framework established by the European Union to regulate the processing and collection of personal data within the European economic area. So I would like to highlight several key uh, principles which are essential for protection of the personal data and which has been uh, implemented uh, by the GDPR. Uh, on the screen, you can see the sectoral application of GDPR. Uh, these are the exactly uh, these are the exact industries which affect uh, which the GDPR affects the most. Uh, now I'm going to move on to the principles. Uh, so number one, consent of the GDPR and uh, the number one can uh, con the the number one principle of GDPR is consent. So the GDPR mandates that individuals must give explicit consent for their data 
to be processed, ensuring ensuring uh, that the data collection and process, processing are transparent and uh, lawful. Now I'm going to move on to right to access. Individuals have the right to access their personal data and understand how it is used and for what purposes it is being used. Uh, another concept that has been highlighted by the GDPR is the data minimization. So in this, there is minimal data collection and retention, which, uh, you know, highlighting, which highlights the collection of data only for some specific purposes that are necessary. Uh, now I'm going to move on to the, uh, move on to the phenomenon of accuracy. So the personal data must be accurate and up to date with every reasonable step taken to ensure that inaccurate data is erased or rectified without any delay. There is another concept that was introduced in 2018 by GDPR, which is the right to be forgotten or data erasure. So it entitles individuals to have the control over their data so that it can be erased under some circumstances. So building on the foundation laid by GDPR, the EU Artificial Intelligence Act introduces a regulatory framework specifically designed for artificial intelligence systems. So it aims to ensure that AI technologies are developed and used in a way that is safe, ethical, and respects existing laws like GDPR and some other European personal uh, individual fundamental rights and freedoms which also includes data privacy and protection. Uh, the highlights of the AI Act can be seen uh, on the left column. So your Number time one is, is up, if you can just go to yeah, the I'm just uh, winding it up. So we're going to talk about risk-based classification. So the Act categorizes AI systems into four levels of risk, which is unacceptable, high, limited, and minimal. This classification dictates the regulatory requirements for each AI system with high risk applications subject to the most stringent controls. Moving on to the transparency obligations for AI systems, especially those interacting directly with humans or those using decision-making processes that affect us personally, the AI Act mandates clear transparency measures. Moving on to the next, safety and fundamental rights. The AI Act requires adherence to the existing laws on privacy, data protection, and non-discrimination. Lastly, governance and enforcement. The AI Act establishes a comprehensive governance structure, which is in addition to the already established data privacy board, uh, which was uh, mandated by the GDPR. In addition, a national supervisory authority and a European artificial intelligence board to oversee the implementation and the enforcement of the Act have been established. So one can conclude that the GDPR focuses on data protection and the privacy rights part, the spectrum, and the AI Act is aimed at setting standards for the development, deployment, and the use of artificial intelligence systems that actually use the personal data. Uh, I would like to uh, just change the slide first. Yeah, so I'm just moving on to the conclusion. So we need AI to be not only innovative, but also responsible and inclusive. So uh, I would like to cite a recent study by Cisco, which was that 92% of the consumers feel that organizations need to do more to reassure them that their data is only used for leg legitimate purposes. Wherein 36% of consumers chose to opt out of AI solutions in making themselves comfortable with AI. So this study suggests that organizations need to be more trustworthy. It need to encompass robustness, fairness, explainability, compliances, and there should be more transparency. I would like to cite another report on bias in algorithms by European Union Agency, which analyzes the challenges and the potential solutions to address biases within AI systems. And uh, a scenario that is discussed was a 2020 event in which the Dutch, the Dutch tax authorities use algorithms that mistakenly labeled around 26,000 parents as having committed fraud in their childcare benefit applications which required them to pay back large sums, which was a big misappropriation at the part of AI. Thus, there's an urgent need for checks and balances in AI applications. That is why AI EU Act was much needed. Now, last, I'm just, this is my concluding paragraph. Uh, I would like to give a metaphor of, of a garden, which vividly portrays the realm of AI. 
as a garden, teeming with diverse evolving technologies like plants in a garden, each AI application has the potential to contribute to the uh, contribute to the beauty, utility, and innovation. This ecosystem thrives on a balanced approach that mirrors permaculture. It's a botanical concept which regulates the growth of the plants so that the garden looks beautiful. So it emphasizes the importance of sustainability, ethical practices, and respect for individual rights such as privacy and data protection. Policymakers, developers, and users act as collaborative gardeners tasked with nurturing this environment. They regulate growth, ensuring no technology overshadows the others and maintain the ecosystem's health by treating data carefully. Thus, I would like Ashubanshi to conclude by saying, so with that, we conclude our exploration, hoping our insights have enriched your understanding and thank you for journeying with us through the AI garden. And we hope our paths cross again in future discussions. Thank you. Uh, right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Rudraditya and Subhanshi. As I see, uh, you had two different, uh, of course, related, but uh, two significant research objectives. One was about AI bias. And uh, second was about uh, data protection, privacy, etc. Uh, one point which I would like to take your attention to is about the EU Act and the GDPR stuff. Okay, now um, each of these acts have their own scope. Okay, EU Act is designed with a specific purpose. It has its own scope. GDPR, you know, what is the scope? You have rightly mentioned about it. Now, of course, there are areas where these two uh, things converge right but then there are significant areas where these will diverge the scope would diverge right and uh, then herein might come in the aspect of bias which you have put in so how do you think that should be or that could be addressed uh, Pam should I highlight the places where GDPR and EUA Act converge because yeah, so a convergence is fine, right? So that, that okay. can of course be done. But there are areas where it will diverge. You understand the scope of EU Act is different. GDPR is different, right? Okay. Uh, so so there could be some aspects which could go tangential to the scope of, of both the acts, right? Are you getting my point? So how yes. would you address those issues? Oh, uh, Ma'am, I believe that, of course, you're right in saying that EU AI Act and GDPR will diverge in the sense if you talk about being taking consent of the person for which the data is processed, or if you talk about processing or storing the data, AI would have a different implication for that. And since you mentioned this would include a bias in that. So for that, we include the bias that actually happened was with the case of Twitter, wherein their algorithms, because of being a black box in nature, where their interpretability and their explainability uh, lacked possible explanations because of which on Twitter, mostly the there was a demographic disparity that was seen wherein women were preferred in searches than uh, men. And there was also this racial discrimination that happened. Of course, these are the biases that has to be addressed when the AI systems are made or developed, as we talked about that this is the very initial step at which the correction has to be done. That is the training data that is provided. And then the act such as EU AI Act would further regulate it to the extent of uh, like Twitter has now rectified those errors because of the technological advancements. So I believe that yes, biases will come up. But then it is the regulation and the technological innovation that will again help it. Rudra, if you would like to add something to it. I would like to add that the GDPR has a totally different essence. I know for sure because the GDPR looks after the data which has been collected, but it regulates how it is being utilized in future. It puts uh, regulations on the companies uh, and restrictions on the companies that how the data should be regu uh, regulated and what kind of data should be regulated. And here in EUI, because artificial intelligence is automated, uh, and obviously in the original source code, there has there have been no uh, ramifications, uh, which are AI centric. So the EU, EU AI Act is for that for the companies which use AI algorithms, which is automated. So automated data collection, and the biases that come, and uh, for example, as I mentioned, that Dutch tax collection wala part. Okay. All right. Thank you, both of you, for your presentation. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mom.
All right. Thank you so much, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank ma'am for uh, being so accommodative of us, for being here, for taking time out of a day and being here for us, judging this participant round. And in the concluding lines, I would like ma'am to actually give us her insights as to what she felt about all of the presenters and the presentations that they have uh, put forth before her today. Right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, you know, for inviting me at the very first place. And uh, of course, talking about the presentation, I really appreciate the diverse range of uh, topics which was covered. Um, I mean, every presentation, uh, I believe, have, you know, presenters have put their heart into it, which was very evident. Um, and also, uh, they were very recent, you know, recent examples were included. And some thoughts about, uh, you know, the general theme of confidence, uh, you know, of course, the presenters did capture the essence of it. But when you say gender, data and technology, so technology, you know, of course, it has always been the backbone of our socioeconomic structure and development. Uh, and as it has progressed, it has metamorphosed things for better. But no doubt, you know, it has thrown a number of challenges which the presenters discussed, particularly when we take this issue of gender bias or gender discrimination. Now, bias discrimination is something which has been existing since ages, right? But through technology, the form of bias, the form of discrimination has changed, right? AI bias had been highlighted by several of our presenters, right? And when you say data the role of data was really uh, you know it came into highlight through when ai came into limelight right because the ai models are particularly based on the data and how bias creeps in is you know what the latest the recent presenters said could be the you know the black box thing or the data itself is corrupt or the data reflects the existing prejudices or biases like the recruitment algorithm example they gave right and again, even as technology progresses even further, so we have AI, we have generative AI, then what is going to be next is the metaverse, right? Which is the combination of, you can say AI, generative AI, blockchain, web 3.0, or you can say semantic web. There have been instances where your digital avatar has been raped in metaverse, right? And that affects the physical being. So bias discrimination when it existed or when it exists in real world, the impact is still limited. Right, but when it comes to cyber world or virtual world, the impact magnifies. It is borderless and it spreads in fraction of seconds. Right. So what has to be done, you know, at the back end, when it's when you say data, data is deliberately corrupted or it reflects existing bias. First of all, the workforce has to be inclusive. Right. So the workforce behind, you know, that entire mechanism has to be inclusive empathy i remember one of the presenter uh, using that term empathy right this is extremely important a strong ethical foundation uh, you know be it we are tackling about we are saying about the governance change in governance structure policy changes or even legislative changes you know uh, emphasis on um, ethical dimensions and again uh, this aspect was also highlighted that it should be region specific it should be unique to the characteristic of that region so when you talk about data if you see global north and global south so global south is the place where the data stems from you know uh, it's freely distributed from global south but it is monetized in global north you know so uh, again if you say gender or problem specific to women of global south are different problem specific to global north women are different you know, so when we want to make such policy changes or legislative changes, or even when we are heading towards a governance structure towards, you know, for these technologies, I think all these aspects should be taken into consideration uh, for sustainable and effective implementation, right? Uh, so with this, I really congratulate all the presenters for their excellent presentations and also to uh, MNLU for all their efforts in organizing this excellent event. Thank you so much, ma'am. And yes, we are very grateful to have such a legal luminary like you at the forefront of law and technology. Since I didn't know you at first, so I went through your LinkedIn 
and i saw okay. your uh, smart contracts using by uh, blockchain technology mm -hmm. and your challenges for patenting uh, artificial intelligence and they were very interesting reads and mm -hmm. thank you so much for taking time out of your day and coming here thank judging you. our rounds first thank you wish you all the thank best you. all of you take care thanks so much thank you to all the presenters as well you can start leaving the meeting